glad to see Professor Chomsky's here. I'm going to keep introductions real short uh, because you're all here to see the man. So just to make sure that everything happens in the best way possible, this is a university. We like to have open debate. Uh, we like to have civil debate. So please don't be rude or obnoxious or you will be removed. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Um, I'm the bouncer. If you want cool t-shirts like mine that say MIT Nerds Against War, you can get them outside. We're going to be having more. And uh, there's also going to be a big demonstration December 10th at 4 p.m. at Government Center. Please come with us. And um, that's a big demonstration against the war. And the other thing is if you want to keep in touch with the MIT folk who are doing this kind of thing, just email peacerequest at mit.edu. And uh, here's Professor Chomsky. Does that warning about being obnoxious apply to me, too? I'm allowed to be obnoxious. Okay, I'll try. Uh, I'm usually pretty good at it, I think. Uh, well, I uh, give lots of talks on all sorts of topics, and uh, being well brought up, I try to cover what I'm asked to talk about, announced in the title. Uh, it's impossible this time. As you can see, the title's way too broad. I suppose it was picked that way purposely, and obviously I have to pick and choose. A uh, second problem is that it just turns out that there's been a cluster of these talks around here in the last couple of weeks uh, about some of the things, including some of the things I was asked to talk about tonight. I don't, maybe some of you were there. I don't like to repeat. However, there are some, point, some points that seem to me so crucial uh, that they just have to be repeated, and I'll just repeat them briefly. I won't go into details. I can go into it more later. Uh, not only because of their importance, but because they're kept out of sight, and until they move into the mainstream of discussion, it seems to me one has to keep emphasizing them over and over again. Well, going to the topics that were announced, uh, there is one thread that unifies them, in fact, runs through all of them, uh, and that is uh, the extreme uh, isolation of the Bush administration uh, on every single topic that's mentioned. Uh, that's unusual. In fact, it may be without historical precedent, at least I can't easily think of one. Uh, in the case of Iraq, it's too obvious to waste any time on. Uh, there's virtually no support. Uh, in the world for the uh, war that the administration is uh, desperately uh, seeking to find a way to have and presumably will unless it's stopped internally. Uh, the opposition is overwhelming. Uh, there's practically no government that supports it and where the governments do, usually the people don't. Uh, that's also true inside the United States where uh, opposition to the war is historically without any precedent at all. I realize that's commonly denied, but on grounds that are interesting and worth uh, looking at, can come back if you like. In any event, it seems to me true without any question that opposition has no, at least I can't think of anything remotely like it in American or for that matter European history. Uh, the, uh, um, on uh, Israel-Palestine, the second issue that's mentioned, the uh, isolation of the Bush administration is also extreme but it can't really be attributed to them because it goes way back, uh, at least uh, 25 or 30 years. Uh, the Bush administration, in fact, has gone beyond its predecessors in isolating itself from uh, 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 world opinion, uh, some interesting respects, which, again, I could go into if you like. Uh, it's worth noting that in this case, the uh, isolation also includes a sharp divergence from American public opinion. Uh, that's been true in the past, but it's uh, much more strikingly so today. So now uh, uh, the majority of the public uh, uh, approves uh, what's called these days the Saudi plan, the plan proposed by Saudi Arabia uh, early this year and adopted by the Arab states. Uh, the uh, 
uh, the, 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 furthermore, uh, by quite overwhelming majorities, unusually high majorities, uh, the population, uh, uh, the, the position of the general population is that if a political settlement is reached of the Israel-Palestine conflict, then the U.S. should equalize support uh, that it gives to the two sides. So the aid to Israel and the aid to Palestine should be the same. Uh, and furthermore, if same big majorities, if one side refuses to uh, enter into negotiations, uh, aid to that side should be cut. Well, the logic of that, if you think it through and look at the facts, is that aid to Israel should be cut and aid to the Palestinian Authority should be vastly uh, increased. Uh, what's the Saudi plan? Well, the Saudi plan, in fact, is a, it's a modification, but not a very significant modification, of plans that have been on the table for years. Uh, they were first uh, proposed explicitly in 1976 at the UN Security Council, uh, where there was a proposal for the kind of settlement that uh, is supported by essentially the whole world and has been since then. Uh, the U.S. veto, all including the Arab states and the PLO, Europe, others. Uh, the, uh, uh, the U.S. vetoed it in 1976, and without running through the history, that veto of a political settlement in one form or another uh, runs right up till today, and it is unilateral. Uh, the, uh, and there are other marginal opponents, but the crucial one is the United States. Uh, and uh, uh, that runs right through the Camp David uh, 2000 uh, negotiations. Uh, if you look at a map, you see exactly why that was another veto of the international consensus on a two-state settlement. Uh, I presume that's the reason why maps were never, present, appear, never appeared in the United States, although they're not hard to find. Uh, it's uh, important that even after the Camp David negotiations broke down uh, in uh, the summer of 2000, Negotiations did continue, and according to the Israeli press, uh, very pro in a very promising way, they claim at least that the two sides were close to a settlement in late September. Uh, that's when uh, Sharon went to the Temple Mount, and the following day, a uh, huge police presence that Barak sent led to killing of a uh, half dozen or so Palestinians, and then the Intifada broke out. Uh, but uh, negotiations continued, uh, and in fact they continued, this is uh, uh, September, October 2000, they continued until January 2001 with meetings in Taba, which were informal but high-level representatives of both sides, and about those we actually have a very detailed record that both sides have confirmed as authentic, uh, and although they didn't reach a solution, they were coming rather close. Uh, we don't know whether it would have gotten anywhere. The negotiations were called off by Israel and nothing's happened since. Uh, but they were moving towards a framework uh, on which there is very broad agreement and has been uh, since 1976. Uh, it was, uh, you can read it in the mainstream U.S. press. So, for example, in Foreign Affairs, the main establishment journal, uh, there's an article uh, last May by uh, Robert Malley who was Clinton's uh, chief uh, special assistant for Arab-Israeli affairs, was his technical name, but more or less the chief negotiator at Camp David. Uh, and uh, he uh, reviews the familiar proposals and goes on to say that they are, uh, it's basic, in his words, it's basically understood throughout the world and has been for some time that this is the central framework of a political settlement. What he's describing is pretty much the Saudi plan, uh, the, pretty much the 1976 plan and a whole series of others between. Uh, now, to some extent, modified. Uh, if you look at his account, it is modified with uh, the proposal for what he calls a one-to-one -one, uh, uh, land swap, pretty much what the Palestinian delegation suggested at Taba. Uh, the reason for the one-to-one -one land swap is that uh, the illegal settlements that the U.S. has funded and that have broken up the occupied territories into cantons, uh, some of them are, at least are so deeply established by now that to dismantle them would be uh, a very difficult undertaking. 
And uh, therefore, uh, what's proposed is that uh, there be a border shift with a one-to-one -one land slot swap with those territories of the inside the designated Palestinian area, uh, hand it over to Israel, but not in the way that's asked. That is not with salience that break it up and into separate cantons, as Clinton had proposed, uh, but modified border modified in some equivalent uh, uh, area on, on the Israeli side, uh, handed over to the uh, uh, Palestinian, new Palestinian state. Actually, there is support for that uh, within Israel over quite a surprising spectrum until you start looking at the reason. Uh, a lot of the support, including from the right, is that it would, if the, such plans were carried out, they would remove uh, a part of the Palestinian population of Israel. They don't like it, but nobody asks them. Uh, they'd move them over to the Palestinian state, and that would help uh, deal with what uh, uh, in Israel, especially in the right wing, is regarded as an overwhelmingly significant problem, namely the so-called demographic problem, uh, which is, uh, you can figure out if you look at uh, birth rates and project a little bit, and they do, of course. Uh, so that's the general framework for a solution more pr proposed uh, at Taba by the Palestinian side. It's endorsed by uh, Mali, and he's right in saying that it's understood throughout the world that those are the basic contours of a possible political settlement. Uh, is it an attractive solution? Well, you can judge, in my personal opinion, it isn't, uh, but that's a separate matter. He's correct about describing the consensus, and it's essentially been that way for a long time. Uh, the only thing, and that includes the U.S. public, a large majority of the public, uh, more strikingly than in the past. Uh, it's necessary, however, to add one thing that he omits, and that's uh, what I just said, that... Uh, the primary barrier to realizing this settlement has been uh, the U.S. government, Washington's actual policies, not necessarily its declared policies, uh, but the actual ones. And that goes way back to the uh, uh, 1976 veto officially. Uh, Israel also objects, but the dependency that it has chosen, it selected a path of dependency. Uh, come back to that in a minute. And that dependency, which is so, is so deep that it doesn't really have any options. Uh, and they're well aware of that. So uh, one of the leading political commentators in Israel a couple of days ago uh, wrote uh, that the boss man called partner is the U.S. administration. And that's essentially accurate. Uh, the uh, earlier steps, which I skipped but should mention at least, uh, go back before the 1976 uh, veto. Uh, they go back to 1971. That was a very decisive year. Uh, in 1971, uh, Egypt made an offer of a full peace treaty to Israel, uh, mentioning, not even mentioning the Palestinians, not mentioning the West Bank and the Golan Heights. Uh, the peace treaty was precisely in accord with official U.S. policy. In fact, went beyond U.S. policy by ignoring the other territories. Uh, it called for a peace settlement in return for Israeli withdrawal from um, Egyptian territory. Uh, Israel considered it, in fact, regarded it as what they called a genuine peace offer. Uh, they recognized in, in a lot of, it's clear in internal discussion, that there was a choice at that point between peace, uh, Egypt's the biggest military force, if they're excluded, that essentially ends military confrontation. So peace... Uh, uh, and some form of integration into the region, or else uh, es uh, expansion. They were at that point expanding uh, settlements into the Egyptian territory, into the Sinai, pretty brutally, in fact, expelling lots of people. Uh, and they had a choice, and they chose uh, confrontation. Confrontation carries with it uh, dependency. Uh, the U.S. had to make a decision, too, and it decided to abandon its official policy and back Israel's rejection of the Egyptian peace offer. Uh, Kissinger's uh, influence at the time. It's the policy that he called the uh, stalemate, meaning no negotiations, just keep using force. Uh, that choice for, uh, was a very fateful one. It, a lot of the subsequent history of the region follows from it. Uh, it led, of course, to continued wars and conflicts. Uh, for Israel, a very close call in 1973. Uh, and plenty of suffering that goes on right till today. 
and, the, uh, and, and for Israel internally, it led to dependency. If you have confrontation, you have dependency. Uh, that's uh, changed the society enormously. It's, uh, uh, become a high, it's become a kind of a copy of the United States and many of the, some of the worst features of the United States as a highly militarized economy, uh, a huge military system. Uh, this internal social system has declined seriously, and there are many other social and uh, economic consequences. Anyway, that was a choice, and it was a clear one. Uh, well... Uh, it's now, the situation is now pretty much, and has been for a long time, that the way the Israeli press described it a couple of days ago, that's Amir Horan, for those of you who know him, uh, the boss man called partner is the U.S. administration, uh, which is a sign of hope for those who here who uh, want to join the international consensus on a peaceful settlement because it means we can do something about it. It's a choice, of course. Well, let's turn to repression, another one of the topics mentioned in the title after Iraq and Israel-Palestine. Uh, here there is an extremely, I mean, there are many aspects of repression. I'm only going to keep to the domestic ones. Here there's an extremely sharp break between uh, the United States and its allies, another example of extreme isolation. If you're interested, there's a good review of it but in uh, the issue that just appeared of uh, the journal Current History by... Peter Katzenstein, but it's pretty well known. Uh, so I'll just use his terminology since it just appeared. Uh, the, there's a comp very sharp split between the United States and Europe on uh, what he calls the uh, Bush administration's Manichaean vision of the world in terms of good versus evil. We're, of course, good, uh, and anyone doesn't go along as evil. Uh, the Europeans and the rest of the world see a much more complicated story than that. That's for children's books. Uh, the, uh, uh, on terrorism, there's also a very sharp break. Uh, the Europe shares the general assumption of academic specialists, without any exception that I know of, and I presume the intelligent systems. We don't know too much about them, but insofar as we know anything, they seem to share the same analysis, uh, namely that uh, terrorism is a real problem, but it's a police problem. Uh, and that uh, if you want to deal with it, you're going to have to deal with uh, underlying grievances that uh, bring people to accept or at least resonate to the message of terrorists who they detest and fear. It's an old story, and I think it's a little question that that analysis is correct. The U.S. won't accept it, at least the Bush administration won't. Uh, they want it to be a good versus evil where you use military force. Uh, thirdly, there's a very sharp split on questions of internal security. Uh, there's near unanimous opposition. Actually, Katzenstein goes beyond. He says unanimous opposition. It's probably a bit of an exaggeration, but at least near unanimous opposition to the uh, egregious uh, violations of uh, 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 elementary uh, civil and uh, human rights and international humanitarian law. Uh, particularly in uh, Guantanamo, you know, a piece of Cuba that the U.S. conquered where it sends people it doesn't like. Uh, the, uh, uh, in fact, the European countries are legally bound uh, to refuse uh, cooperation with the United States or extradition, uh, if only because of the death penalty, uh, which in Europe is regarded as barbaric. It's regarded the way we regard uh, the Taliban cutting off people's arm hands if they steal. So they're legally uh, uh, unable to cooperate with the United States, and there's overwhelming opposition to the, the things like uh, what's going on in Guantanamo, which is pretty amazing, in fact. Uh, and that divergence is very likely to increase. Uh, if you want to know why, have a look at uh, this morning's Boston Globe, which reprints an article from the Washington Post, I think, yesterday, uh, which uh, discusses what the executive branch of the government is now declaring to be their rights, uh, namely to carry out uh, clandestine searches of the homes of U.S. citizens, uh, to secretly declare citizens to be enemy combatants without providing any reason, uh, and to hold them indefinitely at U.S. military bases with no access to lawyers or family until the president declares an end to the war on terrorism, which will, of course, never happen. <laughs> so that means indefinite detention without lawyers, without family, no charges, everything secret. That's U.S. citizens. Um, and with very limited uh, 
a judicial uh, authority to, uh, to intervene. That's what's being declared as the, uh, um, the executive's right. Uh, there, the White House is appealing to World War I and World War II precedents. Uh, either they're unaware of how atrocious these precedents are, or more likely they just don't care. Uh, but they're pretty awful if anyone wants to look at them. Uh, well, uh, George Bush has on his desk, so it's claimed, uh, a bust of Winston Churchill, which was given to him from his private collection by his friend uh, Tony Blair. And uh, Churchill actually had something to say about all of this. Uh, quote it. He said that the power of the executive to cast a man in prison without formulating any charges known to the law and particularly to deny him the judgment of his peers is in the highest degree odious and the foundation of all totalitarian government, whether Nazi or communist. Uh, Churchill was condemning the abuse of executive power for alleged intelligence and preventive purposes. And the year was 1943 when uh, Britain was facing near destruction uh, at the hands of the most advanced military force in the world and also the worst, worst mass murderers in human history, all of which is a little more serious than uh, our situation. And I'm sure that uh, Bush and Blair are pondering all of this daily while they look at uh, <laughs> the bust of Winston Churchill. Uh, and as you can see, it's all over the media. I mean, they're telling everybody that, uh, this all the, every, all the time. Well, uh, let's uh, turn to our own problems, what we face now, and beginning with a high authority, highest perhaps the National Security Advisor, Condoleezza Rice, uh, who uh, informed us uh, back in September that uh, the next uh, evidence we may find about Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction could be a mushroom cloud. Uh, so where's that mushroom cloud going to be? Well presumably in New York. Um, at least nobody else seems to be particularly concerned about it. Uh, even uh, Kuwait and Iran, uh, the two countries that were invaded uh, by Saddam Hussein very brutally uh, when he was an uh, ally of the United States and uh, Britain, a fact that is uh, conveniently suppressed. Uh, so, for example, uh, Today, if you looked at the paper, Britain came out with another dossier, uh, second one in a couple of months on Saddam Hussein's horrifying crimes. Uh, the charges are correct as far as anyone knows, pretty old in fact. Uh, almost all the, the worst crimes that are described there, as in the September dossier, are from uh, the 1980s. Uh, the only thing that's missing, as is always missing and was missing in the September dossier too, uh, is that all of these crimes were considered just fine uh, by the U.S. and Britain, uh, which continued, knew all about them, of course, but continued to support the, uh, the beast, the beast of Baghdad, as he later became. Uh, it had nothing to do with the war against Iran. It continued after the war with Iran was over. Uh, that included... Uh, the uh, providing Saddam with uh, means to develop weapons of mass destruction right up till the day when he committed the first crime that mattered, namely disobeyed orders or maybe misunderstood them and went beyond what was intended in Kuwait. Uh, the, and that uh, in Britain, you could argue it was a different government, but uh, in the United States, it's the people right at the helm now. I mean, they're the people who were doing it. They're mostly recycled Reaganites and, or from the Bush one administration who were carrying out these things. Well, that might seem relevant, but uh, you look pretty hard for it. Uh, actually, not the uh, closest you get, um, to, to their credit, the Times this morning, New York Times in their column on this, did mention one thing, which is rarely mentioned uh, down in the column. They did mention that Amnesty International uh, um, uh, declared, actually repeated uh, a charge it's been making for a long time that the uh, United States and Britain are uh, uh, exploiting uh, human rights violations in an extremely uh, ugly uh, effort to justify their own uh, 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 insistence on resorting to violence. And the human rights world, of course, strongly opposes that. Uh, but the commitment of the people now running the show in Washington and their British counterparts uh, to these crimes is just a fact, and it takes uh, real uh, 
uh, courage and integrity to deny it, as is done every time we hear that can't let this man survive because of the horrible things he did, uh, even the uh, worst imaginable crime, uh, using gas against his own people, uh, who incidentally are his own people in the sense that uh, the Cherokees were Andrew Jackson's own people, but we'll put that aside. Uh, the, uh, uh, and always without mention of the fact that, yes, he did all of that, and we nodded and thought it was okay and went on to uh, support him and provide him with means for developing the weapons of mass destruction he was using and even more awful ones. Okay, that's the background. Uh, well, Kuwait and Iran know about Saddam Hussein, and they naturally despise him, as everyone in the region does, but they don't fear him. Uh, in fact, over the past years, they've all been making efforts to reintegrate Iraq back into their own system, uh, uh, which, you know, anyway, may probably be a wise thing to do anyway. It's their decision. Uh, the, uh, uh, they are afraid. There's no doubt that they're afraid. They're afraid of the United States, and they're not alone in that. A uh, good part of the world, probably a large majority of it, accepts the position that was stated, for example, by Nelson Mandela, who's considered the conscience of the world when he says the right things, uh, who uh, 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 described the Bush administration as a threat to world peace uh, as it follows its dangerous policies of attempting to bully the world to follow its own uh, demands. And that's a very widely felt, held position. In fact, even the national press in the United States, which usually is very supportive of power, uh, recognizes uh, that, quoting it, lead story, in fact, uh, the world is now more concerned about the unbridled use of American power than about the threat posed by Saddam Hussein. Uh, it's not new. This is not just the Bush administration, though they've carried it a large step forward. Uh, you can go back before September 11, back to the Clinton, eight days of the Clinton administration, and you can read in the leading establishment journal, Foreign Affairs, uh, that uh, much of the world regards the United States as a rogue superpower and the greatest external threat to their society, uh, that it is the prime rogue state in the world today. That's Samuel Huntington at Harvard and Robert Jervis, who at the time was the president of the uh, American Political, uh, uh, Political Science Association. There's a very mainstream conservative voices. And these are intended as warnings uh, they were warning the Clinton administration that they're following a dangerous course, uh, and, and these warnings are far stronger today, and they're coming from an extremely broad spectrum, including very uh, uh, the most uh, hawkish strategic and political analysts. So to mention one, that, a recent one, uh, those of you who follow these things will recognize the name, Andrew Andrew Vasevich, who's from Boston University, a uh, highly respected, very hawkish uh, military strategic analyst who wrote in a recent article that under Bush, the United States no longer views force as a last resort, but rather considers military power to be America's most effective instrument of st statecraft as it achieves absolute military superiority over the rest of the world combined and intends to exercise it at will a course that we are uh, to charge down until we drop from exhaustion or fling ourselves off the precipice of our own arrogance. Uh, that's a voice from very respected extreme hawks. And again, it's a warning. It's a warning that under this leadership, uh, the United States is becoming, quoting again, a menace to itself and to mankind happens to be a senior associate of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, but these are not uncommon views. Uh, there is plenty of fear in the world, but it's not of Iraq. Uh, in fact, there is just one country that really strongly supports the coming war, namely Israel, but it isn't expecting a mushroom cloud either. Uh, so the chief of staff uh, recently told the press in his words, I'm not losing any sleep over the Iraqi threat. Uh, and the chief of military intelligence added uh, that any nuclear threat, which is the only one they take seriously, is at least four years away, and that no missiles are deployed that could strike Israel. Uh, furthermore, they didn't add, but we can add, that if there was any hint in Iraq of an offensive uh, capacity, 
uh, being developed or deployed, they'd be blown away um, instantly. Uh, well, without running through the rest of the world, it appears that only Americans uh, have to tremble in fear of immediate uh, imminent destruction, uh, and they do. And there's a drumbeat of uh, dire warnings from high places uh, telling you, you better fear, you better be like my kids uh, 40 years ago when they were in elementary school and were trained uh, to hide under desks uh, to protect them from a nuclear war, nuclear attack in case it came. Uh, maybe, well, some of you or your parents went through the same experience. Uh, so that's what you got to do, make sure you got room under your desk. Uh, because there's a mushroom cloud coming. The, uh, uh, the president, uh, when the president presented the draft of uh, what became Security Council Resolution 1441, you know, the famous resolution last month, when he presented the draft, uh, he informed the citizenry that if we don't do something, he might attack us uh, any day. So it's a grave danger, can't take any chances. Uh, the New York Times lead story maybe cynically, I'm not sure. Anyway, what they said was, and correctly, they said, whatever the diplomatic niceties, the U.S. regards the resolution it is now submitting to be all the authority it needs to act against Iraq. Uh, that was then reaffirmed by Colin Powell and others. Uh, the diplomatic niceties are a fig leaf for editorial writers and diplomats and commentators who prefer to be deceived uh, but the operative doctrine just couldn't be put any more clearly, no matter how they tried. Another high administration official put it, uh, the UN is relevant, he said, uh, if uh, it grants Washington the authorization to do as it chooses, uh, and otherwise it is irrelevant. Uh, it's not new either, but this is uh, the new this stand, which is not unique to this, is unusually brazen. Uh, and there is, really isn't any reason to be surprised at any of this. Remember, these people are almost entirely recycled Reaganites, uh, or else from the first Bush administration, and they're reliving their joyous years of 20 years ago. Uh, now they have a lot more power. Uh, there is no external dis deterrent, as there was back in the 80s, uh, and they have new means of domination that have developed through the 1990s and uh, various uh, instruments of uh, various economic arrangements, international economic arrangements were uh, put in place in the intervening years that do give all sorts of modes of domination that didn't exist before. Uh, we're seeing that very clearly right now in Brazil. Uh, in the, during the Kennedy years, there was a populist uh, president in Brazil, and he was just taken care of by a military coup. Kennedy organized and the Johnson administration implemented a military coup which set off a huge wave of repression and terror in Brazil and in fact because of Brazil's importance throughout the whole hemisphere. Uh, but uh, this time there's no need for, there was a, another populist president elected and maybe the most democratic election in the hemisphere, if not the world, uh, but it doesn't matter. Uh, and you don't have to have a military coup now because he can be strangled by uh, international economic arrangements based on financial liberalization and other neoliberal techniques, and that's exactly what's happening. It's right before your eyes. Uh, the current, that's not the only case, but the most dramatic one. Uh, the uh, current policies that the recycled Reaganites are following are, ought to be familiar. You don't have to look back very far to see them. Uh, when they came into office uh, in 20 years ago, uh, the first thing they did is domestically is pretty much what they're doing now. Uh, the current version is a sharp tax cut overwhelmingly for the rich, uh, which they're now trying to make permanent. Uh, and uh, to quote the Wall Street Journal, the biggest surge in federal spending in 20 years. 20 years is since the first time they did it. Uh, remember, these guys are not conservatives. They are uh, radical, reactionary statists. They believe in a very powerful state, the, uh, but with special purposes. In fact, the, uh, that's why there's such a rapid increase in federal spending, the first one since the early 80s, when they were there before. Uh, and that's also why they're demanding, uh, declaring, they don't even demand, declaring such extreme uh, executive power 
uh, to destroy civil rights of citizens, as in the article I quoted before, without any precedent. Well, what happens when you have a huge tax cut and radical increase in federal spending? You quickly turn the country from budget surplus to deficit, which is exactly what's intended. Uh, as 20 years ago, uh, deficit requires what's called fiscal responsibility. Fiscal responsibility, to translate into English, means uh, to cut services for the general population uh, and to increase services for the corporate sector and the rich, very much like the Reagan years, years of very slow growth, uh, well below preceding years. Um, stagnation or decline for the majority of the population, but great concentration of wealth. Um, there was growth and it was highly concentrated. So that's the plan and we see it happening right now. Uh, and it shouldn't be surprising. It's exactly what they did the first time around. So why be surprised? Uh, especially when you look at the institutional roots of it. Uh, internationally, they're also following pretty much the same programs. Uh, recall that the Reagan administration came into office in 1981 declaring that what they called a war on terror would be a centerpiece of uh, U.S. foreign policy and the rhetoric's about the same as today. And not surprisingly, the war on terror very quickly became a major terrorist war and left an impressive trail of corpses and devastation uh, in the areas that they regarded as Central, Central America and the Middle East, but also elsewhere in Southern Africa and elsewhere. Uh, and they're I mean, maybe the press doesn't want to talk about it, but the people who know about it do talk about it. So the famous uh, School of the Americas, for example, which trains Latin American officers who have an interesting record that we don't have to run through, uh, they, uh, uh, one of their talking points, you know, propaganda points when they tell people how great they are, uh, is that uh, the U.S. Army helped defeat liberation theology, uh, which is essentially correct. I mean, the Catholic Church became a major enemy in the 1980s uh, because it made a grave error. You know, it departed from centuries of history in which it was serving the rich, and it, Latin American Church uh, undertook the prefer what they call the preferential option for the poor, uh, so they, be meaning organizing peasants and all that sort of thing, uh, to try to gain some rights. So, of course, they became an enemy. They became, you know, the equivalent of communists uh, and terrorists, and they had to be wiped out. And in fact, a large part of the 1980s U.S. wars by the guys who are in charge right now wasn't indeed a war against the Catholic Church. Uh, the, you ought to know about it, and if you don't, you ought to find out. Uh, but that's pretty much what happened. Uh, another feature of the 1980s wars uh, was uh, a total of the 1980s regime was complete disdain for international law and institutions uh, that included the World Court, uh, the United Nations, uh, and also, incidentally, Europe. Uh, and uh, the, this recent performance at the Security Council, where Europe agreed to go along with Resolution 1441, pretending they didn't understand it uh, and deciding to believe the diplomatic niceties, as the Times put it, uh, the, that's just a replay. It, it rings all sorts of bells. It's a replay of what was happening in the 1980s. Um, takes a little effort for the press not to report this because it was pretty dramatic. Uh, the Organization of American States is always treated with total contempt. I mean, it goes way back. They're just told, get on board or else. Power relations are such that uh, they just do. Uh, Europe's a little different, but in the 80s that happened too. So what just happened at the Security Council is very similar to uh, what happened in 1986 uh, when the uh, U.S., the Reagan administration, decided to bomb Libya uh, and um, other adventurism, and especially in the Middle East Mediterranean region, was causing plenty of anxiety in Europe. That's problematic for them. Uh, and they were trying to get the administration to stop uh, right after the bombing of Libya, there was a summit of the rich industrial countries, Tokyo Summit, and the Reagan administration circulated a position paper uh, which said uh, line up in the U.S. crusade against what they call terror, or now I'm quoting, the crazy Americans will take matters into their own hands again. Okay, that's uh, the image they want to project. Uh, crazy Americans are going to do what they want unless you line up. Europe fell in the line, uh, just as they did at the Security Council a month ago. 
again, they're afraid of what the, the crazy Americans, actually pretty much the same ones as last time, uh, what they will uh, do if, they're, if Europe doesn't go along. Uh, all of this is second nature to the uh, radical statist reactionaries who are once again at the helm. Uh, and, and, uh, it's, and, and they don't really care if they alienate world opinion. In fact, they probably relish it, you know, especially now that they have such overwhelming military force. Uh, uh, they certainly don't try, seem to try to conceal it. Uh, and the same is true of their techniques of control of the domestic population. Of course, they want to go beyond to the kinds of things that were announced today. Uh, but uh, they've been using a pretty standard technique for beating the population into line. Uh, same thing that they did last time around, namely terrify them. Uh, those are the mushroom clouds that you have to hide from. Uh, it's true that they didn't invent it. It has a long and pretty ugly history. It's a standard technique for uh, controlling a population that doesn't like what you're doing to them. Uh, but they did practice it in the 80s with great uh, skill and enthusiasm. So in 1981, uh, we were all trembling because Libyan hitmen were roaming the streets of Washington, uh, planning to assassinate our leader, uh, who was in the White House surrounded by tanks, and thankfully he somehow escaped. Uh, uh, two years later, uh, Grenada was building an air base, huge air base, uh, which uh, was going to be used to bomb us by the Russians, uh, assuming they could find Grenada on a map, which isn't so easy. And we all had to tremble about that and invade Grenada to save us from that danger. Uh, Nicaragua was uh, what one of their, uh, to borrow the terminology of one of their uh, models, was Nicaragua was a dagger pointed at the heart of Texas. Uh, it was only two days march from Texas, as we were told by our cowboy leader. Uh, they were following, a, uh, that's pretty scary, they were following a script from Mein Kampf according to the Secretary of State, George Schultz, the administration moderate. Uh, they were trying, and that's their plan to conquer the hemisphere. Uh, Reagan called a national emergency because of the threat to the security of the United States uh, posed by this uh, dangerous uh, enemy. Uh, and uh, this was renewed every year, and in fact, so it continued. I won't go through the rest of the details. They're simply uh, replaying the same record now. Again, it's kind of second nature. Uh, well, uh, it, and it works. I mean, in the congressional elections, the midterm elections we just went through, it worked like a charm. Uh, there's now analyses coming out, and they simply report what was obvious in the first place, uh, but now with poll results and so on. Uh, voters retained their um, usual stand, preferences for the Democrats on social and economic issues, uh, but that was eclipsed uh, by uh, security and uh, particularly by the threat of Iraq. So people were so frightened of Iraq uh, that they suppressed their preferences and voted for a powerful uh, leader who will defend us. Um, that's, uh, and if you look at the timing, it's pretty obvious how it worked. Uh, the campaign, electoral campaign, began right after the summer, and that's when we started hearing about mushroom clouds and the Iraqi threat and so on. Before that, Iraq had been presented as a threat, but not an imminent threat. It became an imminent threat from September as the presidential campaign opened, and this is so clear, it's even being discussed openly by perfectly mainstream analysts. For example, the chief analyst for UPI, United Press International, Martin Seif, uh, writes recently that the administration can only sustain power by international adventurism uh, radical preemptive military strategies and hunger for politically convenient and perfectly timed confrontation with Iraq. That's a policy. This is not somebody who opposes their domestic policies. He probably approves them. Uh, the policy is uh, driven by domestic politics under fraudulent pretexts, quoting now the dean of the Kennedy School at Harvard, and there are plenty of others. Of course, there's more to it than this. This only has to do with the precise timing. Uh, there's a long-term uh, interest. Uh, 
regaining control over the second largest oil reserves in the world, which will place the U.S. in a very powerful position. September, and that goes way back, September 11th was a pretext, as it was for many other countries, the Russians and Chechnya and lots of others. And the domestic politics gives a very simple account of the timing, which looks quite convincing. And similarly, it's going to be necessary next year. The next presidential campaign is already beginning with people announcing, Kerry this morning or yesterday, the presidential campaign will soon be underway. And it's crucial for exactly the reasons that Martin Seif of UPI mentioned. It's crucial that there be an easy victory that was chalked up over an awesome foe who was about to destroy us, but miraculously overcome. And the resulting turmoil and chaos and destruction, whatever it may be, nobody can guess, that will either be forgotten or covered up. And we'll be on to some new adventure, a grand adventure to slay some other monster who's about to destroy us, very possibly Iran, what Israel calls the third circle. Second circle is Iraq, and they figure the U.S. will take care of that for them. And then the third circle is Iran, and it's very likely that that war is already underway. There's interesting evidence, which I can come back to if you like. Well, in brief, there is a security problem. The security problem is securing the radical right-wing agenda for another six years, maybe even institutionalizing it so deeply that it will be pretty hard to dismantle. Uh, and uh, uh, actually, it's of some interest, I'll end this part here, it's of some interest that just about everything I've said is drawn straight from the mainstream, uh, uh, even the right. Uh, that's an indication of the unusual uh, isolation of the administration uh, on this topic as well as the others. Well, well, there is something unfair about this, and I'll mention it. Uh, Condoleezza Rice has a point. Uh, when she warns of a authentic security threat, not just the security to the right-wing agenda that they're trying to institutionalize, including, it's not only the threat of mushroom clouds. It's not zero. Uh, Rice, I'm sure, uh, reads U.S. and foreign intelligence reports, uh, including the report that the, the CIA uh, leaked to Congress in early October, uh, which was supported by foreign intelligence agencies who said it publicly, not through leaks, uh, namely, the gist of it is that uh, nobody can find any link between Iraq uh, and uh, terror now, which is not surprising, uh, but that we can construct a link if we decide to do it an uh, easy way, namely by invading Iraq, uh, which they predict is very likely to create a new generation of um, terrorists who are bent on revenge, have many opportunities, uh, and it's also likely, the CIA warns and other agencies, it's likely an invasion to set off uh, terrorist operations that are already in place, uh, perhaps for revenge or perhaps as a deterrent. Uh, and uh, you know, could even include uh, mushroom clouds. We don't know. Uh, there are technical papers in the public literature, and I'm sure a lot more in the literature, internal literature that Condoleezza Rice reads from well before September 11th. Uh, that uh, uh, you can read them in journals right here uh, and publications that there are predictions that uh, there would be a very high probability of success. Some of them say 90% probability of success uh, for a well-planned effort to smuggle weapons of mass destruction, which means nuclear weapons, uh, into the United States. Uh, much higher probability of success than for um, any kind of missile attack uh, with or without missile defense. Uh, and that's years before September 11th, and there's plenty more. Uh, so for all we know, one is sitting in a hotel room in New York right now. Uh, actually, no one expects that, uh, but it also can't be discounted, and you can't discount the warnings of intelligence agencies either. Uh, they are not unreasonable. Uh, actually, the seriousness of such warnings, dread seriousness, was very vividly underscored just a couple of days after the CIA documents were released. Uh, a few days after the CIA documents uh, came the most startling revelation of recent years, perhaps the most startling revelation ever. Uh, it came out of the uh, 
Havana summit that was taking place at that time, a meeting of high-level um, U.S. and Russian and Cuban officials are reviewing the record of the Cuban Missile Crisis from 40 years ago. That was the 40th anniversary. And it turned, it, they discovered, to everyone's amazement and profound concern, that the world came was saved from destruction by one word from a Russian uh, submarine commander, uh, Vasily Akhipov, uh, who uh, countermanded an order from a submarine that was then under attack by U.S. destroyers and forcing the quarantine around Cuba. They were under attack, and they had, turns out they had nuclear-tipped missiles on board uh, required uh, authorization from three commanders, two agreed, and he refused. And that saved it. Uh, if that missile had gone off, there would have you know, been a reaction and a counter-reaction, and that would be the end. We wouldn't be around to talk about it. You can remember, if you like, uh, Eisenhower's warning years earlier uh, that if there were a nuclear war, it would mean the destruction of the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, that's how close we were. It was the most dangerous moment in the history of the world, according to Arthur Schlesinger, the historian who was there, and that's accurate. Uh, it's uh, this uh, very narrow escape from total destruction is highly relevant today. Actually, it's so relevant that it ought to be uh, a prime topic of discussion right in the forefront every day, maybe the prime to topic. Uh, a more than sufficient reason is that we're now consciously escalating the threat in ways that I mentioned and, in fact, many others, which there won't be time to talk about. Uh, also, another reason is because of the circumstances. Uh, recall the reasons for the, what was the background of that. Uh, what was going on then was a U.S. effort at what's now called regime change and a major international terrorist campaign that the Kennedy administration had been carrying out uh, aimed at regime change. Uh, the, uh, and this, I mean, it actually started within a couple of months after Castro took power in Cuba in January 1959, but it really picked up under Kennedy, uh, who ordered his staff to unleash uh, the terrors of the earth, it was called, against Cuba. Uh, this was under the supervision of his extremist uh, brother, uh, Robert, uh, and uh, the reason was, we now know from internal documents, because the very existence of the Castro regime constitutes successful defiance of the United States, a negation of our whole hemispheric policy of almost a century and a half, based on subordination to the Rus Washington's will. There's no Russians, there's nothing to do with it, uh, just what they said. And that terror was escalating through 1962. Uh, it led... Khrushchev to uh, the criminal lunacy of sending missiles, uh, partly in order to deter a possible invasion. The U.S. claims it wasn't planned, but Secretary of Defense McNamara has said that that would have been his judgment, too. He would have assumed that from what was going on that there must be an invasion planned. Uh, then comes the most dangerous moment in the history of the world, uh, after which Kennedy immediately stepped up the terrorist operations again, and in fact, 10 days before the assassination, he'd authorized um, new ones. And that all goes on into the 1990s, late 1990s from U.S. soil, along with solemn discussions about uh, whether Cuba remains a major threat to U.S. security, kind of like the Latin American church uh, and a center of terrorism. Well, the point is that these notions like regime change and international terrorism are not new, as far from the only case, those who are running the show in Washington did break new records in international terrorism during their first phase of their war on terror, uh, but they had precedents and successors through the 90s, and it goes on. Uh, we are now facing similar dangers. The fact that this isn't the major topic of discussion uh, is pretty astonishing when you think about it. Actually, you can check and see how much it's discussed at all. Uh, I don't think the New York Times even mentioned it, as far as I can recall. Uh, well, uh, there's more to it than that. If you look at the record of close calls with total destruction, it didn't end in 1962. Uh, so just keeping to the Middle East, uh, in 1967, uh, according to Secretary of Defense McNamara, we, in his words, we damned near had war 
when there was a confrontation between Russian and American fleets in the Eastern Mediterranean, probably when Israel was conquering the Golan Heights so, uh, after the ceasefire, which enraged both Washington and Moscow and led to hotline communications. So we damn near had war, meaning destruction. In 1973, the war that uh, was caused uh, by U.S.-Israeli refusal of uh, Egypt's offer of peace, in fact, that's forgotten, but true, uh, that war was very dangerous. It uh, was a close call for Israel. It led to a strategic nuclear alert in the United States with uh, a serious threat of nuclear war, according to the main uh, scholarly review of this, Blackman and Hart, the whole history of it. Uh, in 1982, uh, when it, uh, there was a U.S.-backed invasion, Israeli invasion of Lebanon, which led to 20,000 people killed, uh, incidentally, no security pretext at all. It was openly recognized. The border had been quiet except for Israeli attacks north of the border trying to elicit something. Uh, and it was openly discussed by high Israeli officials, high political and security echelon, and plenty of commentators, includes the chief of staff, uh, that the war was fought to try to, uh, 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 it was called a war for the West Bank. The idea was to try to put an end to the increasingly annoying uh, PLO uh, uh, offers for a diplomatic settlement, which were getting out of hand at that time. Actually, the New York Times finally recognized it after 20 years of reporting propaganda fabrications. You can find it hidden. You can find what was open in the Israeli literature 20 years earlier, and of course in the dissident literature, in an article by James Bennett on January 24th, hidden inside the article, but fortunately there. Now we can quote the New York Times instead of high Israeli political and military echelons. Uh, well, as far as we know, there was no nuclear alert, uh, but it was dangerous. The European Union warned at the time of the threat of generalized war, which means nuclear war, and it was averted only by uh, uh, the uh, usual uh, Russian willingness uh, to disregard provocation, and the provocation was pretty severe. Uh, so in the course of the war, Israel bombed the Soviet embassy and then occupied it for two days in Beirut. Uh, Israeli planes, that means U.S. planes, uh, killed uh, 11 Russians who were observed uh, investigating a downed Israeli plane, and they killed 200 Russians who were manning an air defense system in Lebanon. Uh, well, just imagine what we'd be saying if the circumstances had been reversed. If you don't have to imagine it, because we wouldn't be saying anything, uh, since we'd all be dead uh, because of the instantaneous uh, U.S. response. And this is by no means the most serious case. Well, these dangers are now being escalated, uh, not just uh, Condoleezza Rice's uh, mushroom cloud in New York, if the uh, worst predictions of the CIA are verified. Uh, there are more general problems that greatly concern uh, prominent analysts, uh, one of them is Kenneth Waltz, well-known, maybe one of the leading international relations specialists who warned that uh, U.S. adventurism is leading to proliferation of weapons of mass destruction uh, as potential targets come to recognize that they can't defend themselves with conventional forces. The only means available are weapons of mass destruction, and uh, though he doesn't mention it, the other possible means is terror. It's the only other deterrent. And the same is uh, true of uh, Washington's only reliable ally, Israel. Uh, according to the, uh, 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 the um, chief, uh, the former head of uh, Clinton's uh, strategic command, uh, which is responsible for nuclear weapons, General Lee Butler, uh, observed that it's dangerous in the extreme that in the cauldron of animosities of the Middle East, uh, Israel has armed itself with hundreds of nuclear weapons, inspiring other nations to do so, another source of nuclear proliferation. Uh, and the next time, there may not be a Vasily Arkhipov. That was blind luck. Uh, and it continues. These are not the only weapons of mass destruction. So uh, a couple of days after the revelation of the narrow escape from destruction, 
uh, what I mentioned, uh, the uh, UN uh, First Committee, which is essentially the General Assembly concerned with security issues, uh, they approved two important resolutions. That's October 23rd. Uh, one of them was to ban weapons in space. That essentially reaffirms the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. Uh, the second was to reaffirm a 1925 Geneva Convention uh, banning chemical weapons. Uh, there were only two countries opposed, the United States and Israel, which abstained. And a U.S. abstention is equivalent to a veto, in fact, a double veto. Uh, for one thing, the decision is blocked, and for another, it's vetoed from history or reporting. So nothing is said about these two things, which are obviously quite relevant. So, and remind us that the mushroom clouds aren't the only uh, hazard. Uh, biological weapons are as well. Uh, the uh, Biological Weapons Convention doesn't have any enforcement mechanism, which is a problem for everyone, uh, and a particular problem since uh, September when the Bush administration once again uh, shocked its allies. You'd think it had gotten beyond shock at this point. Uh, by suddenly pulling out of a conference on verification that was to be held in November. Uh, and they announced in September, this is, that uh, the U.S. would not consider any further discussion of verification for four years. Uh, just a year before that, that's last December, uh, the United States had stunned its allies by uh, suddenly killing negotiations on an enforcement protocol, uh, claiming that that would compromise the secrets of U.S drug companies and uh, U.S. bioweapons research. Well, a lot more to say about all these things, but the dangers are real. When Condoleezza Rice talks about a mushroom cloud, uh, it's not total fabrication. Uh, there is good news, and we all know what it is. Uh, it's a very free country. It's not Turkey or Colombia or some place where people have to face uh, prison and torture and assassination if they decide to open their mouths. And that means we have enormous possibilities to do anything we like. Uh, also, there's tremendous power uh, in our hands. Uh, if we have the will to use it, uh, there's no need for things to proceed towards these very grim outcomes. It's entirely possible to shift to a more constructive course. And although none of the problems are simple, the you know, ways to mitigate and ameliorate the worst dangers throughout this whole range are pretty clear and have been known for a long time. Uh, and uh, we have it in our power, if we like, to uh, bring them into existence. Stop there. Professor Chomsky is right when he says this is a very free country, but I, I am deeply concerned that for some residents of this country, uh, it's becoming less possible to speak out and have a voice, which is why it's incredibly important that we defend people like Amr Gibran, who was targeted for speaking. And, um, you know, I do believe in the promise of this country, and uh, I think it will be as strong as we uh, make it and, st and stand up to uh, force it to be. Government soldiers raid villages, burn houses, shoot the men, and, and enslave the women and the children. Tens of thousands are held in slavery today. I, two I million think everyone people, agrees with you. It's really not necessary to run. Two million them. people have been killed. Four million made refugees. Why are you not using the vast money you have accumulated selling anti-U.S. and anti-Israel propaganda <laughs> to deal with the suffering of the indigenous black people of the Sudan? Yeah, it's your fault. Uh, well, actually, the money you invented. But if I wanted to make money, what I would do is accept the lush uh, invitations to give uh, $15,000 um, lectures you know, for half an hour and write textbooks and so on and so forth. And you know that perfectly well. Uh, but you're right that I haven't uh, spent, I haven't concentrated my energy on that topic. And I met I'll give you a long list of others. For example, I've said almost nothing. In fact, I don't recall saying anything about the worst war in Africa, the worst destruction in Africa in the last couple of years, which is the Congo. And a couple of million people have been killed in wars in the Congo in the last couple of years. Uh, and we can go beyond Africa. 
I mean, there's hideous things going on all over the place. And if you're Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch, uh, your responsibility is to give a record of all of those things. But a, sing a human being is not an, is, is not an international institution. Uh, so what you have to do, and everyone does this, is select priorities. And there's some obvious ways to select priorities, some very elementary moral principles that guide selection of priorities since you have a finite amount of energy and time. Uh, the uh, main priority is what you can do about it. Uh, so the main, the most elementary moral principle that exists, at least that I can think of, is that we're responsible for the consequences of our own actions. If there's something we do or don't do, we're, and it's, it's anticipated, uh, we're responsible for the consequences. Uh, and this, this happens to be a case where there's very little that we can do. At least nobody's ever proposed anything. On the other hand, there are many cases where we can do a lot, uh, namely the ones where we are responsible for the atrocities. Uh, and uh, massacres and repression and so on. In those cases, we can do a lot, like we can stop. You know, it's the easiest thing to do. And if we were just to go that far, it would reduce the level of violence and repression in the world very considerably. So that's obviously a very high priority, what you can do about it. And it usually turns out to be, you know, things that your own state is involved in. And we understand that perfectly well when we talk about official enemies. So nobody gave a damn what uh, Russian dissidents said about U.S. crimes. In fact, nobody even cared if they supported U.S. crimes, as they often did. What mattered is, what do they say about their own country? It's the only thing anybody cared about, and that's quite right. Mm -hmm. And we understand this perfectly well, and the principles are obvious. The only thing we're not allowed to understand it is when it's ourselves. Then we can't understand elementary moral principles. And that's a rather serious problem. But if you can think of something that can be done about the Congo or the Sudan or about Tibet or about all kind of other you know, places that I can mention easily, and you can too, then by all means let us know about it. Uh, and I'm sure everybody will join to do what they can to mitigate those crimes. If you just want to talk about them for your own reasons, it's of no interest. Uh. Professor Chomsky, first, I want to thank you for actually speaking up the way you're encouraging us to do and be an amazing source of inspiration for a lot of us around here. I have a quick question. Uh, I think it was the LA Times yesterday that ran a story. I think it was Sandy Tolan who was saying it's not only regime change in the Middle East, we're talking about SISP Co. too. And I'm kind about, of wondering... We're talking and, about, huh? We're talking about what? So another SISP Co. Another subdivision. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, you're talking about the article by this uh, I.F. Stone fellow that appeared in the L.A. Times yesterday? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I'm wondering if what, what, what is this story about redrawing the boundaries of the Middle East, and how does this uh, fit in the image you, we're accustomed to see from you in the Middle East, yeah. where the, actually the old system seems to be very favorable already to the U.S.? So how is it different? Yeah. Well, uh, that's an important... I mean, he's... I forget his name, but he's, he's an I.F. Stone fellow at... Uh, Colorado or some such place, yeah, uh, is reporting something that's pretty well known, and it ought to be much more broadly discussed. It's certainly known in the among you know the um, strategic and military analysts and so on, and they're very worried about it. Uh, there is a sector right very close to power now. People like Richard Fer uh, Pearl, who the Washington Press Corps I'm told calls Darth Vader. Uh, and uh, Douglas Fife, and they're close to Rumsfeld. And there's a little circle there, who are regarded even by hawkish military and strategic analysts as absolute lunatics. Uh, Anthony Cordesman, who's maybe the most respected and hard line of the strategic analysts on this uh, on the Middle East, uh, has uh, recently warned the administration and not to pay attention to the what he called the uh, sillier uh, armchair, the sillier neoconservative uh, uh, armchair strategists and their ridiculous ideas, which include these. They have plans, and they've sort of, you know, they're sort of public uh, to uh, reconstruct not only the whole Middle East. I mean, their plans go on to China, they reconstruct the whole world to use the absolute military power that they think they have. Uh, to reconstruct the whole world. That's the kind of thing that Andrew Basevich, this right talk that I was quoting, that's what he has in mind when he gave that warning. Uh, it is a group that's... I mean, we know something about what their policies are and have for years. Uh, remember, Pearl and Fife, in particular, were writing position papers in 1996 uh, for Benjamin Netanyahu. 
Uh, he's the extreme right wing of Israeli politics. Sharon is the dove in comparison. Uh, and and uh, these guys were writing uh, position papers for Netanyahu because they regarded Sharon as too um, soft. You know? and, and those position papers were available. Um, I think they've been taken off their website, but they're around. Uh, they're not very explicit, but yeah, they're about this kind of thing. So, for example, they suggest uh, that the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan, which they assume will be as much under U.S. control as in the past it was under British control, uh, that that should be extended to include parts of Iraq and Saudi Arabia, uh, that Iran should be broken up, maybe partitioned, uh, that, in fact, the whole region should be kind of Ottomanized, you know, turned into something like what the Ottoman Empire was, uh, with local regional authorities, you know, and so on, but power centralized, and power this time will be centralized in Jerusalem and uh, Washington, a subsidiary in uh, Ankara, uh, and that'll reconstruct the whole region, and then we go on to everywhere else, like China and so on. Uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty much what they have in mind, and that's what he's describing. It's well beyond the Sykes-Picot Treaty, which he referred to, which was the British... Uh, you know, that's where the lines were drawn around the things that are called states in the Middle East back during the First World War. Uh, Professor, you had mentioned that uh, confrontation have, has led to dependence. Confrontation, you had mentioned that uh, confrontation between Israel and Palestine has led to the dependence of, of Israel on the United States. Uh, no, that's not what I said. It was the, at that time, there was no Palestinian issue. Yeah. This was confrontation between Israel and Egypt. Oh, this which, is 1971. Which led to the dependence of the Israel on United States? Pardon? Which led That's to, pretty yeah. much led oh, to the, I mean, yeah. the decision of Israel to reject peace mm -hmm. entailed confrontation, which furthermore entails dependence. Uh, I want to ask you if there's a similar situation between, uh, because I'm from India, I want to ask you if there's a similar situation between India and Pakistan, where like uh, Pakistan gets one ship from the United States and India is happy because it got two ships from the United States or something like that. And, uh, like, we are having two countries fighting and the United States saying not to fight, but it sells weapons to both the countries in, in different ways. And uh, so are you not seeing a similar situation? Are we not seeing a similar situation here where we are having two countries fighting and basically it's like the British divided and ruled us 300 years ago. And here we are making the same mistake again, fighting among each other and, uh, well, you know, I'm the United States yeah. taking advantage of it. Mistake, depending on how you look at it. Did you read Advani this morning? No. Well, uh, what is he, a uh, foreign minister or... Uh, Jaswan Singh? Uh, Jaswan, Advani, Jaswan Sinha? The minister in the government, I forget which. Jaswan Sinha. Pardon? Uh, Jaswan Sinha in India. No, no, Advani, who's LK, the, the leading minister. figure He's in the, the BJP. I forget what yeah. minister he has. Yeah. Uh, this morning, he, uh, or yesterday, he uh, dared Pakistan to fight it out man to man, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah. He said, let's have another war. <laughs> okay, that'll show you. And another war will presumably mean a nuclear war, which will mean maybe this time it will be the, you know, it won't be the northern hemisphere, it'll be the eastern hemisphere that goes up in smoke. Uh, but yeah, that's what they're pushing towards. Uh, he, he was talking, making campaign for the Gujarat election. You know, this is... I have to tell you, it's pretty ugly. It's the one place where the BJP has a pretty strong yeah. hold. In fact, the only province they won last time. And it just they just orchestrated a big massacre there. And, you know, it's the, the way you sell your position there is to look very tough, something we've heard of. But I think your, your point is right. I mean, India and Pakistan, uh, India was, uh, India has moved back into the U.S. orbit, was, you know, sort of neutral or something for a long time. Uh, now it's uh, uh, part of the U.S. system, especially under the ultra-nationalist uh, BJP rule. There's a right-wing Hindu nationalist extremist government, which is kind of a counterpart to Islamic uh, radicalism. Uh, and, uh, you know, the picture of these two groups sitting there fighting each other with uh, nuclear weapons and both part of the U.S. alliance, and as you say, both being supported by the U.S., it's not a very optimistic picture. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's also, incidentally, a, an Israeli-Indian alliance that's developed as part of this. So they're now, it's called a Hindutva Zionist alliance. Hindutva is the ultra-right-wing fanatics in India, and they're lining up with extremist elements in Israel, both of them in positions of power. Uh, and by now, there's a lot of uh, arms 
transfers and military assistance and cooperation and so on. And you can see why they both have the same enemy, uh, the Islamic world. Yeah. Yeah, just another question. Uh, do you see, like I find that the Indian media never report about the Indian support to useless American policies, to be frank. Uh, the Indian media never reported it. I've never, never seen Never reported them. what? The Indian media never reported uh, situation, uh, instances where the Indian government plainly submits to U.S. policies. They don't discuss it? They don't discuss it. Is it like similar to the way U.S. media I mean, works? Even journals like, say, Frontline? Uh, Frontline just described your lecture when they came. They never, I never see them describing they American foreign it. policies. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't read the Indian press regularly, so I don't know. But uh, yeah, it's not, you know, it wouldn't be too surprising. I have to say, I was in India for a month, almost a month last I asked November. you a question on Digo Garcia. Oh, you did? Yeah. yeah. But, you know, one thing that struck me when I was there <laughs> was, uh, <laughs> sorry, I don't recognize faces ever. Uh, I, I was kind of struck there by uh, uh, how thin their reporting was altogether in the Indian media. I mean, India is one of the few countries, you know, I travel a lot, it's one of the few countries where I, I wasn't able to get international news. You know, you couldn't pick up the International Herald Tribune or something unless you went to the airport. Uh, and the press coverage was extremely thin. In fact, I was kind of shocked. I went to Pakistan a couple of days later, just for a few days. But the Pakistani press, which is a military dictatorship, at least the English language press, was far more free and rich and so on. Uh, so, but these are superficial impressions. Of, you know a lot better, I'm sure. Uh, Professor Chomsky, you referred briefly to the internal security measures that we're seeing in the United States. Do you do you see any historical precedent for the internal security that we're seeing either yeah. domestically or internationally? Yeah, exactly the precedents that the White House is, uh, is uh, stressing. The Wilson government and uh, the uh, Roosevelt government during the Second World War. I mean, the, the Wilson administration was much worse. Uh, in fact, the you know, during and after the war, they instituted, remember back in those days, the Wilson days, there wasn't much protection for freedom of speech. In fact, freedom of speech, although people, you know, they teach you in elementary school that it's in the Bill of Rights, it actually wasn't really instituted until, you know, it, it, didn't, it wasn't even authorized by the courts in a very broad way until about the 1960s in the course of the civil rights movement. Uh, so when the Wilson administration... Uh, instituted uh, what became the so-called Red Scare, uh, that was pretty vicious during the war and afterwards, uh, much worse than anything that these guys are so far talking about, at least. Uh, and the, uh, that's uh, when the FBI was, the FBI came out of that, and also the ACLU came out of that in reaction to it. Uh, and uh, during the Second World War, it, was pretty, it wasn't that bad, but pretty bad. Uh, actually, the U.S. record during wartime uh, even though the U.S. has never been under threat, remember. You know, it's not like Britain in the 1940s. In fact, it's never been under threat. Uh, the uh, U.S. record in wartime is very poor as compared with other industrial countries, which have been under much worse threat and far worse than countries like, say, Nicaragua, which was you know, remarkably open during the uh, U.S. war against it. Uh, if you are interested, I've written about this and done a lot of detailed comparison, and it's known. So, for example, Justice Brennan was one of those who pointed out that the U.S. record during wartime was really pretty bad, uh, which it was. Now, what these guys want to do is go back to it, uh, or that's what it sounds like. Uh, and, in fact, they are making declarations, declaring rights that go beyond uh, what was declared, at least, in the past. And it's pretty striking now, because by now, as distinct from, say, the Wilson years, uh, there are... Uh, uh, there is a framework of judicial protection and constitutional reinterpretation that for freedom of speech and other civil rights. So there's much more in place protecting civil rights than there was in those days. And uh, just a different public, you know, public's kind of used to and accepts these rights. So, but it's dangerous. Yeah. I mean, in fact, what they're doing so far is going mostly after really vulnerable people, you know, as you heard. Uh, or in Guantanamo and so on. But uh, they're demanding those rights against all American citizens. And if there's anyone here who wants uh, John Poindexter reading his email, I'd like to know who it is, <laughs> not me. <laughs> uh, you said moments
moments ago how important it is to choose priorities in terms of there are a lot of atrocities going on in the world, but you have to pick on certain ones. Each of us does. Yes, and I hear that. And I think it's also important that you and the speaker preceding you, Abir Jordan, said that Saudi Arabia, and you said specifically about the Saudi Arabian plan that's been you're working on in terms of the Palestinian Israel state. And he spoke about um, how Israel is the only, uh, the only place that has religion involved with it and that everything should what? be open. The Israel is the only country that has religion? That has, has, no, 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 that has religion associated with its uh, laws. I said that? No. The speaker preceding you said that Israel should be open, as is every other country. However, specifically Saudi Arabia, if you ignore everything else about it, especially concerning I'm the human sure rights I'm not sure what abuse, you're saying. What, human what is your abuses. point? You don't understand what I'm saying? Have you, do you know about the human rights abuses? The, the in Saudi Arabia? Yeah, anti I'm str I mean, for 40 years, ever since I started. in Saudi Arabia. That's yeah, ever all since, right, very uh, against human rights that you're an advocate of. But barring, no, bar, no barring that, you're taking that as a paradigm country. Do you care country. what the facts are? That, are you saying that there's no... There's, there's, no, there's about, no about my, what I write about this? I mean, for 40 years, I've been condemning the U.S. policy of supporting uh, vicious and brutal dictatorships in the Arabi uh, Arabic world, uh, Arab world like Saudi Arabia. Yeah, however, you're claiming, like you and the speaker preceding you said that Israel is the only country that has... Well, then talk to him. I didn't... Okay, so I will. I'll, I'll direct it to him. I don't... I don't Fine, then why don't you go out and have a discussion said, with because him? Because you said that Saudi Arabia, you're accepting their plan as one... No, uh, I'm talking about the Saudi Arabian plan for the Middle East, for but Israel, Palestine. A, you're taking a plan from a country that has... A, has the Saudi Arabia, look, look you didn't hear one word. I'm sorry, sorts. you didn't... Let me repeat what I said. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. are taking... You're, you want to state a plan ba of, of what to do with uh, in a fair system between Palestine and Israel from a country that has zero regard for... Dis dis has complete disregard it's a for the country. women. We agree, it's a horrible country. So, what does that have to do with anything? Yeah, but you're taking their... You're taking their <laughs> What do you, if you agree it's a horrible country and you're letting them dictate... I'm not letting them dictate policy. anything. Yeah, you are, because no, you're no. saying that we should adopt their plan. Uh, look, you didn't hear what I was saying. And but also, I, no, but the speaker preceding you also said that... Can I, I, also, can I funny, repeat like what I said, also. which I think everyone else in the audience heard? I said the Saudi plan is a minor modification of the international consensus, which was accepted by virtually the entire world in 1976, and which the U.S. vetoed, and now it's called the Saudi plan because it was reiterated by Saudi Arabia early this year and accepted by the Arab League. So when pollsters ask people, what, plan, what, do, you, what do you support, they say we support the Saudi plan because that's no, the only no, thing no. they heard. Do you realize that it's legal for, illegal for you as a Jew to enter Saudi Arabia? Pardon? You're not allowed to enter Saudi so Arabia. What does that have to do with whether I should accept the... Inter what does that have to do with whether I should accept the 1970s? You're, you're not even allowed to enter. You, you will be just allowed to enter Abs the land. Yeah. And actually, it's, you know. I mean, I don't see why that's funny. Like, I don't understand. Do you, do you see any? Can no, no, no. Do, because in Israel, in Israel, anyone is allowed to enter. Look, the I think everybody else. <laughs> let me repeat. What I th if you don't want to call it the Saudi plan, the way the people who ask the polls call it, call it the 1976 uh, Security Council resolution supported by the entire, virtually the entire world, including the major Arab states and the PLO. Call it that. Call it the, the 1976 Security Council resolution, or call it the 1980 Security Council resolution that the U.S. also vetoed, or any of another series of things. I called it the Saudi plan because that's what pollsters use. That's the term they use when they ask people what you support. And the reason why they use that term is because it made a big splash in March uh, when it was reiterated a little bit, modified by Saudi Arabia and accepted by the Arab League. If you want to use a different name for it, fine. makes no difference what name you call for it. it has nothing to do with the internal structure of Saudi Arabia. That should be obvious. Okay. I was wondering if you could discuss the, uh, the evidence you mentioned that the Bush administration is already planning an attack against Iran, especially in light of the re renew, recently renewed student democratic movement there. I, I, the new government, yeah. The new, sorry, I didn't hear the end. You mentioned in your talk that, that there was evidence a, that the Bush administration plan was to, already okay. planning an attack against Iran. There's some information. You know, we don't have a lot of evidence. We don't have declassified documents on these things. They're happening now. But there are, uh, there are scholarly studies and some press reporting, which do describe it. If you want a picture of what I'd suggest you look at is uh, 
um, in the journal uh, Middle East Policy, which is one of the main Middle East journals, uh, um, this summer there's an article by Robert Olson, who's the leading U.S. academic specialist on this region. And he reports some interesting things. Some of it he gives evidence for, some of it he picks up here and there. Uh, and it's not implausible. What, he suggest, uh, what is reported and known from other sources is that, uh, uh, let's go back a step, uh, Israel as an adjunct of the United States, it's a small country, but as an adjunct of the United States, it's a huge military power. In fact, according to the IDF, you know, Israeli Army, their own, their analysts, uh, it has, uh, its uh, air and the armored forces are more advanced and technologically more advanced and larger than those of England, France, uh, or Germany. In fact, any NATO power other than the U.S. Uh, and uh, according to Olson, about 12 percent of that force, uses Israeli sources, is uh, permanently based in Turkey. Okay, that means southeastern Turkey, where these huge U.S. military bases are. Uh, the armored forces are in southeastern Turkey, presumably in case the Kurdish population gets out of line again. There was a massive and a horrifying uh, counterinsurgency operation against the Kurds running through the 1990s, peaked under Clinton, one of the worst atrocities of the 1990s, all coming from American arms, so it never gets reported. Uh, but, you know, now it's kind of, they're kind of subdued. But uh, actually, I've been there, and I'll be there again in another couple of weeks. It's pretty awful. Uh, the, uh, so that's presumably what the armored forces are doing there. There's been a lot of um, uh, Israeli-Turkish uh, military cooperation. Uh, the air forces are, according to Olson, flying at the Iranian border uh, as part of the planned war for what Israel calls the third circle. You know, after you get rid of Iraq, you move on to Iran. Uh, is Israel has always quite publicly been trying to get the U.S. to take over the war against Iran. Uh, the reason is that it's the one country in the region, despite Israel's military power, it's the one country in the region they know they can't really control militarily. So they want the boss to do it for them, uh, as he's called in the Israeli press. They want... Uh, and. Uh, uh, then, you know, Olson goes on with other things, and there's other sources that report it, too, uh, um, aiming at this, kind of like the Pearl Fife plans that were mentioned earlier, uh, plans to try to move towards some kind of partition of Iran by stimulating uh, uh, Azerbaijani nationalism. That's a large part of the north and, uh, you know, moves to the oil-producing regions, trying, and moving towards a kind of separatism, which actually the Russians tried to institute 50 years ago, and the U.S. then objected. Uh, but uh, uh, apparently the U.S. and Israel are moving toward this. And the idea would be to uh, uh, partition Iran. And the Iranians are very upset about it. They know about it. You know, it's discussed in Israel in Iranian press and so on, and obviously don't like it. Uh, and this uh, pr looks like the beginning stages of uh, uh, the, next, the next war, maybe the one we'll be looking at next year. And you can't know, you know, you can only look at the evidence around and make some speculations. But that's the kind of thing I had in mind. Yes, Professor Chopsky, thank you for your presentation. Um, my question is, has to do with oil and the ruthless pursuit of oil by this administration, as well as, um, as the silence of the press on that issue. And I was reading the Progressive uh, this last week, uh, and I, was, I came through um, an article on oil is our damnation. Basically, they were saying, we haven't even heard from the main, me the main uh, media about what are the stakes here in terms of profits for our corporations. And it's really like our state going to war to defend this interest. So it's basically killing for oil. So have you crossed any good journals or any good articles yeah. on this issue? Because That's I think that is yeah. on top of the table, and we are not hearing anything on yeah. this issue. Well, first of all, it's all over the professional journals, like the petroleum journals and so on. But it's even in the mainstream press. It's scattered. That's true. But, for example, the Washington Post has had a couple of major articles on it. Uh, and the point is pretty obvious, and everybody knows it. Uh, it's not just a matter of – I mean, it's partly profit for oil companies, but that's only a piece of it. Uh, when it is, when it, I mean, the reason that the administration and the press are playing it down is precisely because they don't want people to say what you're saying, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, they want it to look humanitarian and, uh, you know, those wonderful things. Uh, but everyone who pays any attention to the region knows 
uh, that the reason they're going after Iraq uh, is because it has the second largest oil reserves in the world. Huge oil reserve, uh, very little of it, much of it not even explored yet, so you really don't know how much there is, and very easy access. Uh, and it is not a matter of the U.S. getting access to it. You can find a lot of articles in the press saying, well, how could we be fighting for oil? You know, we're not looking for access to oil. That part is true, but totally irrelevant. Uh, the U.S. insistence on controlling the oil reserves of the region goes way back. It's not the Bush administration. It starts and you know, goes back to the 1920s, in fact. But it really became a huge thing uh, in the mid-1940s when um, the U.S. was kind of you know, dividing up the world. It was in a position to do so at the time. And it, uh, one of the, and we have all these documents, so, you know, a ton of documents about this, so we know what they were thinking, and it's perfectly reasonable. Uh, the U.S. was going to take over the oil-producing regions. Uh, this, France was, it had been French and British mainly. The French were just kicked out by legal chicanery. Uh, the British were absorbed as a junior partner, as the British Foreign Office called them. Uh, the, uh, that's so it was going to be an Anglo-American condominium over the oil-producing regions, and they knew what they were. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can go back to State Department memoranda in 1945, uh, which described the, just Saudi Arabia, which is the biggest, as in their words, a stupendous source of strategic power and the great, one of the greatest material prizes in world history. Then later, you know, the greatest opportunity in the world in the field of foreign investment and so on. That's even more true of the whole Persian Gulf region. And it remains so. So you look through the rest of the declassified record, it's always true. So in 1958, say, which was a very important year in Middle East affairs, that's when Iraq pulled out of the condominium. Uh, the Eisenhower, who was very concerned with these things, uh, said that uh, the loss of control, not access to, control over Middle East oil would be a catastrophe, so it would be worse than the loss of China, which at that point was you know, considered the worst catastrophe, some words approximately like that. It's always control, not access. Uh, and uh, there's a very simple reason. The United States didn't need access to it. I mean, North America was the biggest producer up until around 30 years ago. Uh, and even after that, uh, most U.S. oil comes from places like Venezuela. And if you look at intelligence projections, we have intelligence projections from the National Intelligence Council, you know, the highest body, for the next 15 years. And they say, yeah, Persian Gulf oil is going to increase in its significance and utilization will increase, but the US, and therefore the U.S. has to control it. But the U.S. itself will rely on more stable and reliable Atlantic Basin sources. That means Western Hemisphere and uh, West Africa. But you still have to control it. Uh, it's not a matter of access. And the reason is very simple. Go back to the uh, stupendous source of strategic power and the greatest material prize in world history. And um, strategic power is, means lever of world control. You control that, other people do what you say. Uh, if the U.S. can control production and pricing levels, not too high, not too low, you know, it's where they want them, uh, that's, first of all, it breaks up OPEC, and it gives the U.S. a tremendous lever of world control. Also, the U.S. will undoubtedly get military bases, which are important there. Uh, material, to your point about the profits, that's real. The material prize uh, means that you can ensure that the huge wealth that flows from this goes into the right hands, uh, meaning, first of all, not the people of the region. That's critical. Uh, although it does go into the pockets of the rich thugs who you put in there, like the Saudi Arabian dictators who were talked about. It goes into their pockets, but not the population. Uh, and most of it goes off to the West, primarily to U.S. and British energy corporations, though there will be some trickles for others to keep them in line. Uh, yeah, if you can control all that, it's uh, what one standard history of the energy system calls a wealth beyond the dreams of avarice. Uh, so, yeah, that's really important. Uh, but, and it's not just the energy corporations. Remember that the petrodollars, they recycle back to the U.S. economy. So when the U.S. sells, say, you know, advanced uh, military systems to Saudi Arabia, uh, the money goes back to high-tech industry and places like MIT. Uh, our salaries, remember, get paid because we're part of the uh, system by which... Uh, high-tech industry is subsidized by the public and Saudi Arabia and others under the pretext of defense. Uh, anyone?
teach at MIT who doesn't know where their salary comes from, ought to do a little research. Uh, and, uh, and it goes back to the whole high-tech economy. Also, it goes into treasury securities. Huge. It's unknown because it's secret, but it's clear that huge Saudi resources and other countries go right off into the treasury. Uh, and it goes into construction firms. And that's the way Bechtel becomes a big firm by you know, building all kind of palaces and stuff in Saudi Arabia. So there's all kinds of ways in, in which the money gets recycled back into the US and British and to some extent other economies. Uh, oil profits are a big piece of it, but not the only piece. Uh, and it is wealth beyond the dreams of avarice and an enormous source of stupendous source of strategic power. So how could they not be interested, be insane if they weren't interested? I mean, these policies go back to the First World War, you know. I mean, you, you have to be, you know, pretty dull not, not to see what's going on. But you're right, it is barely covered. Uh, although everyone know, who knows anything about the area knows about it. And occasionally you will get articles like the ones I mentioned in the post. Uh, hi, uh, Professor Chomsky. You, you read a lot of newspapers. I have to say that right off. Um, <laughs> and it's impressive. Uh, I, not impressive, sort of a, just hard work. I'll try to keep this, this brief, but uh, one, uh, the question is basically, um, with all respect to the nerds against war, uh, who's working on the non-nerds against war? Um, is there anyone working, uh, working to bring out the non-nerds against war? The general, the general public who don't oh, concern yeah. themselves There's nerds. There's enormous public resistance. That's good. And, and the... Um, <laughs> I mean... I'm glad. My, my, que my question mean, is, can, how, how, I would I, how would I present it? I talk about it if you like. Sorry? It's not, it's nothing to do with nerds. You know, you oh, no, no. I, yeah, I just I mean, was kind of a joke. Large, you know, it's, it's typically the case that the more educated sectors of the population are less involved in anti-war protests. Right. That was true in the 1960s. It's true today. I mean, there's a, the car, it's not, you know, the educated, I mean, the educated are the people you hear, of course. Right. Like they're the ones who write articles and stuff. Okay. But if you look at uh, uh, anti-war attitudes, and often activism, it doesn't correlate with education. It's usually negatively correlated yeah, with no, it. It's I, probably true now, too. I, I understand that. Um, the, the real question was uh, uh, to, um, I come from a family of people who didn't go to school, and I try to get these ideas across to them. And you have to do it in an elevator speech, in a, you know, a three-minute speech that, or talking to them in three minutes, expressing any ideas. Is there some as a place to learn how to do that, to find out how to do that, people you can talk to, to... First of all, doing that I, skill up. I don't even believe it, at least. But, you know, I, I don't want to talk about your, I mean, you obviously know your personal experience, and I don't. But I don't think it's generally true. I can tell you where I got my political education. It was from uh, unemployed uh, working class people um, in New York, relatives, um, a lot of whom never went through elementary school. I mean, you know, they were very, I mean, the cultural level was higher than the Harvard Faculty Club, in my opinion. Uh, but uh, it's nothing, uh, you know, there's, it's, it's just, it's, you know, if people have been beaten into submission, it's, I suspect, right below the surface. You know, I, I don't know the people you're talking about, obviously, but I wouldn't be surprised if they, you know, these are families where two people work uh, 50 hours a week to put food on the table, uh, and uh, they don't have anything in the way of benefits and security and they're drilled into them from infancy that they got to consume everything so they're maxed out on five credit cards yeah, uh, and that whole picture. Well, you know, if you're driven into that situation, you don't have a lot of time to think about anything. I mean, you know the people and I don't, but right. it, it, a lot of that is true. I'm, I'm done here, but um, is there, I don't know if there's is anything there a way to do, do it? To just do ordinary, that. you know, these are per, pe, the same way you do with everyone else. Okay. I mean, I give talks all the time to audiences that look to me like that, you know, the, the very scattering of, scattering of college students, small scattering. So like I was in Milwaukee a couple of weeks ago, at, which is a working class Catholic town, uh, and the talk was, the talk actually was organized in a technical school, you know, which is kind of like a vocational school for the local population, but it's only because they had the biggest auditorium. A lot of them were around, uh, but just general community. And it's just like, you know, talk the same thing talk in Kennedy School, same talk. And nobody seems to have any problems with it. In fact, less problems, because they don't have all the barriers to understand it. <laughs> but, uh, and that's not unusual. I mean, you know, you just, obviously, you, you know, you don't, you gotta talk to people about the things that concern them. But that's true whenever you're doing any kind of organizing. 
activism. But there's no other, if there's any other secrets, nobody's ever found them. And it's, you know, it's never really been a problem. Thanks. Uh, well, we can go on a little more. Yeah. 15 minutes? Till nine? Well, till nine, okay. Yeah. Um. Were you, uh, did you already have a shot at it? Yeah, I did. Okay, let okay. other people come in so you don't, mono it's only fair to not monopolize it. There are a lot of people who want to talk. If there's time, you can come back. Um, okay, Professor Chomsky, I just wanted to ask, like going back to Israel real quick, it seems that, going, seems, going back to Israel real quick, oh. it seems the occupation has been obviously a complete disaster for the Palestinians, but it, for the average Israeli, it seems to not be a very good idea either. Terrible and, idea. you know, Israel is a parliamentary democracy, yada, yada. Who is it benefiting in Israel? I mean, how is, why is that, why are they continuing with that policy essentially? Well, you know, I, I mean, I agree with you. I, th I thought 30, I mean, th there were Israelis who pointed out right away, right in 67, that this is going to be a disaster for Israel. Actually, some pretty prominent ones, like David Ben-Gurion, for example, you know, the sort of founding father of the state. And they're, uh, what they were predicting was right. It is a disaster for Israel. It's eroded its... In fact, the people who support the occupation, and they call themselves supporters of Israel, but... I agree with uh, the Israelis who call them supporters of Israel's eventual destruction and moral degeneration. Uh, and uh, this is, comes from generals and high military officers and uh, you know, mainstream journalists and others. You know, I think that's probably right. Uh, sitting with your boot on somebody else's neck is not good for you. Uh, it leads to all sorts of negative things, quite apart from the war and the oppression and so on. So you can read in the mainstream Israeli commentators 20 years ago, you know, when Israel still had total immunity, as it had until recently, from any retaliation from within the territories. I mean, you can read accounts by, you know, leading military and strategic analysts about how, uh, you know, the worst thing that's happening to Israel is having, at that point, I think it was, you know, three-quarters of a million young people being taught in the army that their task is not to defend the state, but to make sure that the Arabushim don't raise their heads. Arabushim is... Uh, slang for like niggers or kikes uh, and they said when people when that's the way our youth is being taught and trained and being ingrained into them uh, that you got to humiliate people and degrade them and you have to treat them like uh, drug roaches running around in a bottle as the chief of staff said at the time it's just going to harm them I mean even if you can hold on to the territories and get the water and yeah that's been happening uh, who is it benefiting well you know like when I go home tonight I'm going to go to a nice suburb up in the hills around Boston. That's who it's benefiting. If you, if you, I don't know if you've traveled there, but if you, well, take a, you know, go around the uh, hills around, the, you know, the places that are being settled, and settled with big subsidies, incidentally. People are being subsidized to move to them, uh, meaning out of our tax money, if you sort of trace it back. Uh, they're going to the nice uh, hills, uh, suburbs around uh, Jerusalem and Tel Aviv where you have a short commute into the city with uh, big highways and stuff like that. So, and, uh, you know, about most of the people moving there are not uh, the religious crazies you hear on television with the Brooklyn accents. Uh, most of them are people who uh, just want to have a nice life, you know, have a, a villa, as it's called, meaning you own your own house and have a lawn and uh, you have green lawn, you get the water from stealing the resources of the Palestinians who don't have anything to drink, but you don't pay any attention to that. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, a, it's just a nice lifestyle. So if people are subsidized, they'll move out. Actually, it also follows that if they're subsidized, they'll move back. And if you take a look at polls among them, plenty of them, you know, probably an overwhelming majority, would move back into behind the Green Line, the international border, if they weren't subsidized to live there. Uh, so they're gaining. Uh, the... Uh, you know, Israel is taking resources, like, say, the water, which is significant. There's the big aquifer is under, mostly under the West Bank, so they're using those resources. But that's replaceable. You know, it's not essential. And it's just uh, the usual support that comes from military conquest and the degradation of other people. I mean, who, who was gaining from South African apartheid? You know, who was gaining in Alabama when they could uh, uh, crush the niggers there, you know? I mean, some kind of gain, but uh, you know, it's, it's not on, not dissimilar. Um, 
Hi, Professor Chomsky. First, I want to say thank you um, for speaking to us and taking questions. It's, it's an honor. Um, I've heard a lot about you, but this is actually the first time I've heard you speak. And I was sitting here um, intently listening to everything you said, and I counted, there were a number of these, but I counted at least five points that you brought up that were just um, blatantly wrong or in the very least misleading. And my question is, why does a brilliant, world-renowned linguist, and I'm also a little confused about the connection between linguistics and no Middle Eastern politics. Zero, zero. Maybe I'm the only one who doesn't There's see that no obvious connection. There's no connection whatsoever. But why why, does, you why do you need to use false well, information? Why don't you list the five points? Well, you mentioned um, the settlements in the Sinai, um, the illegal settlements. There were tons of them. You said the Israelis fled there. There were maybe a few settlements, and they were definitely not illegal. They were perfectly legal. Um, Egyptians want of peace in 71. We actually got peace later during that decade, and it was peace with the Egyptian leader. And even then, the Egyptian, Egyptian people weren't happy with peace with Israel. They didn't want it. Not to mention the, their attack on Yom Kippur in 73, but we'll skip over that as well. No, let's add that. <laughs> in fact, I mentioned it, so let's add it. You said unprecedented, anti-government, whatever, right? Um, Here. Doesn't Bush have one of the highest ratings since, like, Eisenhower? I don't know why. I didn't vote for him, but Bush is very well liked okay, that's and four. has very high ra ratings. Yeah, I got that one. What's the fifth? Um, the Israeli aggression against a peaceful Lebanon in 1982. Pardon? The Israeli invasion of Lebanon? In 1982, against a peaceful Lebanon, a yeah. Lebanon that wasn't at all attacking. Um, a family member of mine was killed prior, so please when? don't call them peaceful. When? Um, prior to the invasion. When? The exact date, I don't know. Was it in between summer 1981 and summer 1982? Why? Because that's the year when the border was quiet, except for Israeli attacks to the north. The border was quiet? Yeah, I'll give you all the data about it, if you like. It's not this, you can pick it right out of the Israeli records. Uh, there, were, there, were, uh, there were constant, is, uh, there was a ceasefire. Well, uh, I'll, let me talk about that. Uh, that's the fifth. Is there another one? Okay. Also, you said um, refusal for Israel refuses to negotiate, right? You mentioned yeah. um, if the U.S. gave equal support to both sides and then took away support if one side stepped away from the table. Wasn't it Israel who wanted to negotiate in 2000? And wasn't it um, PLO stepped back once we almost reached a settlement? Okay, is that, yes. uh, is that all the yes. list? All right, let me run through them. Uh, the settlements in the Sinai are universally regarded as illegal by the United States as well, uh, and they weren't a few settlements. Israel was building a city there. They were building the city of Yamit, which was going to be an all-Jewish city in an area of the northeastern Sinai from which uh, thousands uh, probably... And was it regarded as illegal? By While everyone. it was an Israeli By everyone. Territory? I mean... You know, the, George Bush, the ambassador, U.S. ambassador, for example, there's just no question in international law, and nobody doubts it, nobody even questions it, that a settlement in occupied territories is illegal. It's repeatedly, I mean, up till today, the Security Council continually reiterates it, uh, that settlement in these territories is what they call flagrant violations of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Uh, and it goes right up till the present moment. If you want, I'll give you the li In fact, the U.S., up until Clinton, the U.S. always voted with, uh, with, the, uh, major with everyone on that. It's always unanimous. Uh, Clinton is the first one who backed off. He didn't vote against it. Uh, the U.S. V uh, abstained in uh, October 2000 when that was again reiterated. Bush went a step further by trying to undermine, in December 2001, the meeting of the high contracting parties of the Geneva Convention, that's 114, everybody was there, including even England, all of Europe, which again reiterated the view the, well, over and over again. It is international law, unanimous, over and over with Security Council, never a veto. Uh, and, but the high contracting parties have reiterated it. Uh, the U.S. always supported it, that any settlement in the territories is flatly illegal grave breach of the Geneva Conventions, which means a war crime. That's even talking about the West Bank. I mean, in the case of settlements in Egypt, there wasn't even any discussion about it. It was so obvious. Nobody even discussed it. It was taken for granted by the entire world and every authority that the settlements were illegal. They were not scattered settlements. Uh, the army came in, uh, drove out about 10,000 people uh, into the desert, you know, put them behind barbed wire, uh, destroyed the towns, destroyed the mosques. Destroyed when was the, this? 1971. It was called the Galilee Protocols. Uh, the, uh, and they were building the city of Yamit. It was the Golda Meir government. 
uh, Israel Galilee, who was the Minister of Interior or something, who planned it and implemented it. Uh, Sadat, uh, F, uh, in, that's number one. Uh, what I said was correct, but understated. It's much worse than what I said. Uh, the Egyptians in 1971, if you want to look at the details, in February 1971, the Egyptians, uh, ex there was a UN negotiator, Gunnar Yaring, who made a proposal for a full peace treaty between Israel and Egypt, didn't mention the Palestinians, didn't mention the occupied territories. It would be full peace in return for Israeli withdrawal from the Egyptian territory. And this was the Egyptian leader or the UN this representative? This was Sadat. This was President Sadat. You just said it was the UN representative, the Egyptian. No, no, you didn't hear me. I said the UN negotiator presented the plan to the two sides. Egypt accepted it. That's President Sadat, President Sadat of Egypt accepted the proposal for a full peace treaty. Israel considered it. They recognized it to be, as I said, a genuine peace offer, uh, but they decided to reject it because they wanted to expand into the Sinai. Uh, that was, uh, and they recognized, you look at the internal... If they wanted to expand into the Sinai, why did they return the Sinai? Now, then we'll come to that. That's your next point. So you were flatly wrong about number two. The next one comes at the attack in 1973. Well, after Israel, at that point with U.S. backing, because the U.S. shifted its policy and decided to back Israel's rejection of the of UN 242, in fact, which is what was well, at stake. Well, the U.S. didn't May actually back them until Look, the war. I'll let you Sorry. give your points. Now, I'll show you why they're all flatly wrong. Okay. The third has to do with the attack in 1973. Uh, what happened after Israel, after Israel re and the U.S. refused to accept peace in February 71, Egypt continually said, look, if you don't accept peace and you continue to build in Egyptian territory... Wasn't gonna... Egypt at the time practicing um, all their military strategies up on, onto the Israeli border no, during those nothing, two years? Nothing. Actually, was... three years before that, the Egyptians there was a, kept there was practicing... A war of a, there was a war of Why was the war a surprise There was a war of attrition before that, if you want me to go back further, which included, for example, uh, Israel's bombing of Suez and driving a million and a half people out and so on. Yeah, we can go back there, but we're starting with 19. 71, okay? Yes. I'll During be happy the time to go back. I'll be, to go back. I'll be happy to go back to 1900. I'm talking if you about want. 1971. Uh, in 1971, to repeat, uh, Egypt offered a full peace treaty mentioning nothing about the other occupied territories, nothing Isn't about. Isn't it the fact that while they were offering this peace treaty? Can I treaty continue? <laughs> Can I continue? If you You're still wrong. You're giving me wrong information. Egypt was doing nothing at the time. It they had military acts coming up to Israel. You don't want to hear the answers to these questions. That's pretty obvious. Okay. Let me go ahead and give you the... All right, maybe you don't want to hear. Maybe others do because you brought them up. Can, yeah. If, if you'd like to ask further follow-up questions, please send me an email. I'll be happy to send you all the resources. I'm just going to pick the actually six things that you mentioned. Uh, we're up to the third. The Egyptian attack in 1973. I was starting to give you the background. Uh, after Egypt offered peace and Israel and the U.S. refused it, uh, the president, President Sadat, r continued to say openly, publicly, in every way he could, that if Israel and the U.S. refused peace and continued to build in the Sinai, Egyptian territory, he was going to have to go to war. In 1972, he kicked out all the Russian advisors. He did everything the U.S. wanted. Uh, the U.S. and Israel basically just laughed. They assumed there's a period of enormous triumphalism and they thought they could just disregard Egypt. Well, in 1973, October 73, to everyone's surprise, Egypt actually attacked. Did they attack Israel? No. They attacked Egyptian territory, which was held by Israel, in which Israel was settling. Yeah, Egypt attacked Egyptian territory uh, in 1973. Uh, the war was, a ver was very dangerous. As I mentioned, it was a close call for Israel. Uh, called led to a nuclear alert. It was a close call for all of us. Uh, but uh, finally, there was a settlement. Israel at that point and Kissinger recognized they cannot disregard Egypt as a basket case. They got to deal with Egypt. Then comes shuttle diplomacy and a whole bunch of things coming up to the Camp David, first Camp David agreements in 78, 79. Uh, which you mentioned. At that point, Israel and the United States accepted Sadat's 1971 offer, okay? 
uh, except that by that time it was a much harsher offer because in the mid-70s the Palestinian issue had arisen, which it hadn't in 71. So Egypt, when, it, when Sadat made the, repeated the offer in 77, it now included withdrawal from the occupied territories and the Palestinian, Palestinian self-determination. Well, you know, harsher than 71, but the U.S. and Israel did go along. They had no choice. Uh, so that's number, uh, f uh, that's number uh, three. Uh, we then go on to, uh, yeah, the 1982 invasion. Uh, the, uh, I don't know how far you want to go back in history, but let's just start with mid-1981. Uh, in mid-1981, there's a huge flare-up initiated by Israel, uh, as usual, across the border. Uh, it, led to, it led to a Palestinian reaction. It ended up with, I think, 450 Lebanese and Palestinians and I think around eight Israelis killed after the exchange. The U.S. stepped in, instituted a ceasefire, this is, uh, you can read this in uh, Schiff and Yari's sure. book, for example, Standard Israeli History. Yeah, please do. Uh, they instituted a ceasefire, a summer 1981. The following year, uh, the, if you look at the standard U.S. accounts, like William Quant, the main history, you know, from National Security Council and so on, what he says is from 1981 to 1982, uh, the border was quiet. Well, that's not exactly correct. They were, it was quiet from north to south, but Israel was continually attacking. There were all sorts of attacks, sinking fishing boats, killing people, bombing, and so on, trying to elicit some Palestinian reaction. Excuse I, me, can I continue? In, I, May, in May of that 1982, there was, for the first time, a light Palestinian response. Katyusha Rakis, off, which I don't think killed anybody. Uh, finally, Israel gave up trying to elicit a pretext and just invaded flat out with a U.S. green light. Uh, and the U.S. then vetoed Security Council resolutions to get them to try to stop it. Uh, the, inv uh, the invasion was serious. It ended up killing on the order of 20,000 Lebanese and Palestinians. Uh, U.S. supported it all the way. Uh, the, uh, uh, and the goal was exactly what I said. Uh, you can, uh, you know, read the chief of staff, the prime minister, you know, Israeli analysts and so on. They all pointed out that the goal of this invasion is, they called it the war for the West Bank. We must make it clear to the Palestinians that they're going to play no role in the West Bank. If you look at what was happening before, the PLO was making repeated offers for uh, diplomacy. This was regarded in Israel, I'm quoting their leading historian on this now, Yehoshua Porat, uh, as a uh, veritable catastrophe for Israel because it didn't want to make a political settlement. So therefore they had to go to war, and they regarded the war as a success. The war was a success because it demolished uh, the PLO and undermined the offers for political settlement. All right, then Israel stayed there for another 18 years until 2000, violating Security Council resolutions. And during that period, now according to Lebanese sources, about another 25,000 people were killed with several invasions and so on. So that's 50,000 people. Okay, that's the 1982 invasion in the background. Uh, the, uh, Israel's refusal to negotiate now, that's not debated. Israel refuses to negotiate now. That's what I said. I you, said in 2000. Sorry, you, you shifted it. You said, what about 2000? Yeah, in 2000, Israel was willing to accept the uh, Camp David offer, as I mentioned, as soon as you look at the Camp David offer in 2000, you see exactly why it didn't get anywhere. Uh, the Camp David proposals, just take a look at any of the Israeli maps. Uh, it uh, breaks up the West Bank into three separated, virtually separated cantons, north, central, and uh, southern, all separated from a small part of East Jerusalem, which is the center of Palestinian commercial and uh, cultural life and transportation, uh, all separated from the Gaza Strip, the future left indefinite. So it's a f it, it doesn't even approach what South Africa established 40 years earlier. Uh, and the idea was quite well expressed by the Israeli negotiators, like Shlomo ben Barak, who's, uh, uh, Shlomo ben Ami, who's Barak's chief negotiator. Uh, just before they began, he, he's a historian. He wrote a book in which he explained that the goal of the Oslo process is to establish a permanent neo-colonial dependency for the Palestinians in the occupied territories. So yes, Israel was quite happy with that, except uh, it couldn't be accepted. 
And as I mentioned, negotiation, now I'm relying on the Hebrew press, negotiations then continued uh, in exactly the way that I said, up to Taba, and we have an independent confirmation of what happened in Taba. The European Union had a, an observer, Martinos, who wrote a long detailed account of it, which is published in the Hebrew press. It was authorized by both sides, and it's the way I described. Uh, the Palestinians were proposing what Mali wrote about in foreign affairs, a one-to-one -one land swap. Uh, Israel insisted on a three-to-one land swap and a salient extending east of Jerusalem, including the town of Ma'ala Dumim, which was established in the middle of the West Bank uh, in order to partition the West Bank. If you want to know what that looks like, if you read Hebrew, uh, B'Tselem, the main... Israeli human rights group just came out with a big report uh, in which for the first time they were able to get the official maps, the Israeli official maps. Uh, Israel's been withholding the maps that show the town boundaries, okay? And B'Tselem was finally able to get them with a lot of threats to go to the courts and so on, and they're published, so you can read them. In fact, you don't even have to read Hebrew, you just have to look at the maps. Uh, that one town, Ma'al Adumim, uh, its town boundaries extend to Jericho. Uh, and that's the idea. You split the West Bank in two, uh, and then there's another salient to the north going through Ariel, which pretty well splits the top two. Yeah, Israel would be satisfied with that. Uh, but right, but Taba improved it somewhat, and it could have gone on, but exactly as I said, we don't know where it would have gone because Barak called it off. So we don't know where it would have gone. Right now, and that's what I was talking about, Israel refuses to negotiate. Flat refuses. Uh, no controversy about that. So therefore, if you follow the position of the majority of the U.S. population, and that's two, to th two or three to one in the polls I was citing, depending on the question, so overwhelming majorities, then the U.S. ought to cut its aid to Israel and vastly increase its aid to the Palestinians. So that was correct. The last point is about the unprecedented opposition. Well, that's pretty clear, in fact. Try to think of a case in history when there was large-scale public opposition, demonstrations, protests, and so on, to a war before the war was started. Okay? Uh, I don't know of a case, not in U.S. history, not in European history. Uh, and uh, that's unprecedented. People compare it to Vietnam, but see, that only shows how limited the protest was about Vietnam, which is interesting. Uh, the, pro the comparable period in Vietnam would have been about 1960. Uh, in 1961 and 62, the Kennedy administration publicly announced, like it wasn't a secret, you can read it in the New York Times, publicly announced that the U.S. Air Force is beginning the bombardment of South Vietnam. They publicly announced programs to drive a couple of million people into what amounted to concentration camps where they would be put behind barbed wire to separate them from the indigenous guerrillas. Uh, they began chemical warfare programs to destroy crops uh, to, so that the guerrillas wouldn't have uh, food. Uh, that's all, they authorized napalm. Uh, that was 1961-62. Uh, where was the protest? Zero. I mean, I remember it very well. You couldn't get two people in a room to talk about it. Nobody cared. You know, we want to attack another country and wipe it out. Who cares? Uh, this, uh, the protest actually began four or five years later at any noticeable scale. At that point, South Vietnam had been practically wiped out. Uh, there was B-52 saturation bombing of the densely populated Mekong Delta. Nobody knows how many hundreds of thousands of people had been killed. Uh, much of the country was destroyed. The U.S. had then extended the war to the north and to Laos, later Cambodia. Yeah, by that time, you started getting some protests. Years after the war began. Okay, now you're getting it before the war starts. There's no analogy to that. I can't think of a case in the history of Europe or the United States. If you can think of one, let me know. So, yes, it's unprecedented. I want to apologize, Professor Chomsky. You clearly you have all the facts and all the knowledge, and you can just pull I'll it out, it. and you know it all. I guess I just find it odd that your degree is in linguistics. And yeah, there's no reason for it to be odd. For Middle Eastern Look, history. Let, let, me, see, let me just comment on that. See, it's, well, that's fine, but there's an interesting point there, and let me just tell you some personal history, which tells you something about the intellectual culture. I don't mean this about you. Uh, the fact of the matter, and if you ask professional linguists, they'll tell you, is I don't have any credentials in linguistics. 
I wouldn't be admitted into a reasonable graduate program, like I could never get into our program, because I basically have no credential. I have a very strange background. It, it just, you know, the reason I got a job is because it was in an engineering school in an electronics laboratory. And they didn't give a damn what your credentials were. They just looked at what work you were doing. Uh, and I've had an interesting history. I mean, in my own work, it happens to have ranged from mathematics to things like this. Okay? I don't do it much now, but in the late 50s and early 60s, I was doing straight mathematical work on theory of automata. I might get invited to give a lecture, say, at the Harvard Graduate Math Department or at the Sorbonne or something like that. Nobody would ever ask what my credentials are. That would have been considered imbecilic. Who, who cares what your credentials are? What matters is what you're saying, you know, not whether you got a, a you know, you have a mark. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and this is this is very striking. The only places where people care about credentials are in the fields that don't have any substance. There they care about credentials, you know. Uh, and it's, it's very dramatic. But like nobody in a math department would ever dream of asking about it. I mean, one friend of mine and I, about 30 years ago, uh, he, he was a he's biologist by, in theory, kind of like I'm a linguist, no credentials either. Uh, we decided to teach a course in perception, which neither of us knew anything about. Uh, so we, uh, we got the electrical engineering department to take the course. Uh, it's fine, because around here nobody cares about credentials, fortunately. And the two of us caught a, taught a course in perception to graduate students because we wanted to learn something about it. Okay? And that's what a seminar is. You, know, you learn something about it. It's a cooperative uh, operation. Did anybody care? I mean, did the, the people in the brain sciences care? Did the engineering department care? No, nobody cared. Because nobody cares what you're. I mean, we have people doing terrific work in linguistics who are, you know, have, have never taken a course in the field. They just sit in on courses here, you know, uh, for years uh, informally, and finally they learn as much as anybody, and they do great work. Does anybody care what their credentials are? I mean, it's ridiculous. You only care what work people do, and these topics, the things we're talking about here, I mean, they're within the range of any high school student. You don't need any credentials. There's nothing to understand. You know, what is, uh, all you need to be able to do is read and think and have a little bit of skepticism and do some hard work and so on. There's nothing to, you know, there's no credentials would even help you. I mean, th th there's nothing you could learn that would help you do it other than how to read, you know. Uh, in fact, my own feeling is that maybe the best training in fields like this is uh, the physical sciences because there at least you learn what an argument is, you know. <laughs> I'm not joking, but uh, all right. Last last two questions, and then we'll have to leave. Yeah. Well, I thought we were out of time, so I'll try to be brief. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I have almost an embarrassing thing to say and to ask. I'm sorry, I can't hear. You see, I think I'm here in vacation. And it's almost embarrassing to say I'm from Israel. Now, this is not a very, it's not a very, doesn't make me proud to walk in here tonight. I was almost shocking, actually. I've studied you in the philosophy department in Hebrew U. I've studied you as a philosopher. And I, by the way, I think that a philosopher has, question, has a lot to say about political, yeah. about political thought. Anyway, I just want to comment about one thing. You said that the Israeli army is in a big problem because today it's not defending the Israeli state, it's defending the settlements, the occupied territories, and therefore the only way to, to educate the soldiers is to, our job is not to defend the country but to keep the, as you said, Arabushim, a vulgar way of, of, uh, of Keep them from raising their hands. Yeah, keep them from raising their hands. Well, I, I have to say one thing now. It says, I was not only a soldier, also an officer in the Israeli army. And before I get stoned, yeah, That's fine. I want to say that... What's your question? Uh, first, I have to make a statement, okay. a quick statement, that in the Israeli army, we never, ever teach soldiers that they have any offensive job here. We hear about protecting lives, 
We hear about preventing terrorism and the, the basic fundamental values of the Israeli army are human values. Now, okay, now I have to, Okay. Please go ahead. Okay. Good. It's just like the American army. In fact, I actually, don't know. Actually, actually it's very interesting. Like the vulgar values that we might see in Israeli society are imported from the United States of America. Like what is your point? Like, now I used to want to I'm sorry. May, may I correct, first of all, you're, you misheard. I, when the quote that I gave, I said, was not about today. It was from 20 years ago. Oh, if you want to know the source, it's Yoram Perry, professor at the Hebrew University, who's one of the leading uh, analysts of the military army. And 20 years ago, uh, he was pointing out that the army is being destroyed by the fact that three-quarters of a million people have learned, not been taught, of course, every army says, yeah, we're all in favor of human rights. They had learned from their experience that your job daily is to beat people, degrade them, humiliate them, and make sure that the Arab regime don't raise their head. So, yeah. You want to know when he wrote it? It was right after there was a big outburst of terror uh, in the territories in 1981, IDF and settler terror, which scandalized Israelis, uh, and they just called it terror, and it was pretty brutal and awful. Uh, and that's when Perry wrote this. That was 20 years ago, when Israel was immune, as it remained for another 15 no, years. No, I do but believe that the Israeli society the did shift in the past 20 years 20, yes, towards worse. a real peace-seeking society. Now, um, well, it can easily prove no, that. Okay, no, it can no, easily no, prove now, that by withdrawing it, from the territories. Well, obviously. No, actually, you mentioned that by polls. You mentioned the beginning of the of your your lecture. U.S. Now, polls. I just want. No, actually, actually, I think, I think we're okay. I think he's had a long speech already, but go ahead, finish. I think we're okay. I think we're okay. I just want, I just want to ask you. a I, factual mistake. Go ahead. I, I just want to ask you that um, after, how, how did you respond to the fact that for the past two years, there has been violence in the Middle East and that Israel is exposed to, to almost daily terrorist attacks by suicide bombs? Uh, and... With, that started while the, this Palestinian attack started while the negotiation channels were open. Okay, I might agree with you, I might not, that the deal we offered them wasn't a great deal. It might have been a fair deal, it might not have been a fair deal. That's open to, but, but the negotiation channels point? were open. Yeah. And when therefore, they, how can you legitimize close? when did they close? An attack. Well, when did they close? Oh, you said they, they closed even after. They closed at Taba. They closed at Taba. That was a few months after. That's no, 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 so therefore, while, no, while the no channels of negotiations in, were open, sorry, the, were, we were attacked. Israel was attacked by a massive uh, uh, attack. That was by, after Taba. What? That was after Taba. Take a look. The, uh, the Take attacks? Look. Yeah. After, attacks? This is the first few months. No, no. The, the Taba, Taba was after the, uh, after the Intifada began. Yeah, but the attack, the Intifada was fought almost entirely in the occupied territories, as before. There were random examples, but the major attacks that you're talking about came after. Up for 35 years of occupation, harsh, brutal occupation, is the, uh, the atrocities in the, the atrocities were Israeli atrocities against Palestinians in the territories. There was virtually no Palestinian response even in the territories until a few years ago, and in the last two years, it's hit Israel. There had been rare occasions before. It's an almost entirely after the negotiations broke down, and in fact, things have changed. If you take a look, say, uh, at the time of Taba, the uh, ratio of Israeli to Palestinian deaths was on the order of four or five to one, or six to one. By now, it's down to about three to one. Uh, so now it's maybe three times as many Palestinians killed as Israelis. Uh, so the balance has indeed shifted, and it was predicted. So, for example, uh, uh, Ami Ayalon, who you know, he was the head of Shabak up until 2000. He predicted at the time, 2000, he said, look, if we're going to continue repressing the Palestinians, it is going to lead to terror. And the only way we can deal with the terror is to give them their legitimate rights. Uh, 18 years before that, in 1982, so we'll go back to 1982 again, 
the head of Israeli military intelligence, Yoshevat Harkabi, former head, also a leading Arabist, made exactly the same point right after the outburst of uh, settler idea of violence then. He said, look, if we're going to continue crushing the Palestinians in the territories, sooner or later there will be terror against us. And the only way to deal with it, as he put it, is he, well, his phrase was, if you want to kill the mosquitoes, you're going to have to drain the swamp. And so the, the that paradox is that big. No paradox. For 35 years, Israel denied, even denied the existence of the Palestinian nation, like the arrogant remark of Golda Meir. But, There's no paradox. It, but Every Israeli the first authority. time Israel was actually trying to create Sorry. an independent Palestinian what state, happened? that was the moment huh, because what where, the, where the violence broke out. This is the it's an incredible phenomenon. Out, the violent, look, I don't approve of the violence. I've always thought they shouldn't do it. And the fact that it is finally hitting Israel after 35 years of crushing Palestinians is not nice. But the viol if you want to look, the violence broke out out of desperation. I mean, at that time, Palestinians were cut uh, even before Camp David, before Camp David 2000. Palestinians in the, uh, I don't know if you were there, but if you were, you would have seen that Palestinians were in over 200, actually 227 isolated enclaves surrounded by big infrastructure, by barriers. If, they, if somebody wants to visit their grandmother or go to a hospital, uh, they got to get out of a taxi on one side and walk across a barrier and try to find one on the other side. Uh, people couldn't go to, I mean, they couldn't get water because their well was on the other side of a barrier. I mean, at some point, the humiliation and degradation and destruction just got too much. But the amazing thing is, I just want to point out, Because of time, this is just the last question. Do we have to let the poor guy? Never let this one finish, by the way. Okay, why don't, if you think he didn't finish, why don't you finish? Go ahead. I just wanted to point out that for the first time in 35 years, Israel was ready to discuss the, the creation of an independent Palestinian state. And the minute we started that, yeah, it's an amazing coincidence, that is when the violence broke out, not when we were denying the Palestinian state. As... Um, Henry Kissinger said it, I think. The Palestinians never. That was Abba Eben. Wait. It was Abba Eben. It was Abba, I'm sorry. The same. They were the same. The Palestinians never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. May I answer that? The violent, you've got the timing wrong. Uh, at Camp David in 2000, what Israel and, uh, offered and Clinton offered was something that did not reach the level of South Africa 40 years ago. Okay, what they, I described it. What they offered was four separate cantons in the West Bank, separated from Gaza, uh, with Israel in total control of the resources. And it was described by the, may I, did I let him finish? Uh, it was described by Shlomo Ben-Ami, you know, Israel's chief Barak's negotiator, as a permanent neo-colonial dependency. Yeah, at that point, the Palestinians finally gave up. Uh, and I don't think they should have done it, but they did resort to violence. And in fact, look what happened during the violence. You want to know? Do you read Hebrew? Yeah. Can you read the, the Hebrew press? You can, but the IDF has now released its account of what happened in the first couple of months. Okay? In the first few days of the Intifada, the first few days, uh, they report that they fired a million bullets. And one Israeli general who heard it said, that means one bullet for every Palestinian child. Uh, in the first month of... May I continue? May I continue? May I continue? In, you want the journal and the author? I'll be happy to give it to you. Fine. You don't have to investigate it. Just write me a letter. I'll give you the date and the journal. And in fact, if you like, I'll send you a Xerox of the Hebrew copy. Okay, fine. Please do. Uh, the, uh, uh, in the first month... Uh, they uh, determined that the number of ca that the casualty ratio was, I think, 75 to 4. Okay, 75 Palestinians, four Israelis, all in the occupied territories. That's the first month, and it sort of continued like that, uh, the way it had before, until finally it began to change. It began to change in a horrible way, and by now it's reduced to maybe three to four to one. And every day, you know, there are more Palestinians being killed. I mean, today uh, we heard that uh, a Palestinian was, uh, a 70 year old man was killed when they bulldozed his home over them. Uh, in the British press, but not here, you can 
read that, yeah, that's been going on for a long time. Uh, uh, and in fact, uh, about a year ago, there were eight Palestinians uh, killed when, a, when uh, uh, their uh, uh, homes were bulldozed over them. And if you know anything about Israel, you'll know that this goes back well before. So, for example, right after the 67 war, when Israel cleared the Palestinians out from the area in front of the what's called here the Wailing Wall, uh, the way they did it was give them a couple minutes notice and then bulldozed it all. Nobody knows how many people were killed there. Yeah, that goes on all the time. Uh, and uh, it's true, you're absolutely right in saying that when Israeli soldiers are taught, they're taught we're humane, we have the highest values, and so on. And the same is true of every other army I've ever heard of, no matter what they carry out. Okay? Next question. Um, I uh, come out of a background that might be similar to yours. I fought again for the, in the civil rights movement and also almost lost my right arm in a car that was bombed. I was fought against the uh, Vietnam War. And uh, what disturbs me most about this is I feel like I'm in a pro-war rally in 1965. The distortions aren't really what you say, they're what you, not, you don't say. And that's what's really troubling. So could you give some examples? Yeah. Um, for example, the vulgar term that you used, that you said uh, some Israelis, I say, I guess, Arabushin. used... Um, but you didn't mention the fact that in the Egyptian press, in the school system, in uh, Palestinian schools, etc., that the virulent, rabid, anti-Jewish, not anti-Israeli, anti-Jewish uh, line that comes out it is designed to create hatred. Um, that, for example, the Saudi, the Saudi plan doesn't, you didn't mention that they refu have refused to talk to the Israeli, Israelis who had wanted to discuss it with them. No, that's absolutely false. They offered to discuss it and Israel refused. Okay, well, th that's right. not what but I was told you, by somebody point, in the Saudi, I happen to, I happen to your know. Your first point is correct about the anti-Jewish rhetoric in the Palestinian press and in Egypt and I, so I, I'm just giving those as examples. And, I, and I'm also concerned that, you know, that obviously the Palestinians are in a difficult situation. Obviously that, you know, you can say that the offer that was made is not the was not the offer they wanted. But from the Israeli perspective, you could also say that that wasn't a very good offer for them either. Their country was going to be split into two with a little corridor of, of 14 miles. All Israel. I'm saying that on either side, that might not have been the ideal solution. But the issue is, the question is, whether we're going to support solving problems by negotiation, are we going to solve problems by trying to murder people? Right. And if we say that someone, well, they've been pushed to murder this person. Well, he was mm. pushed to murder his wife because she nagged him. Okay. Well, they were pushed to murder because X, Y, Z happened. The point is, if you're at negotiations and you want peace, that you negotiate for peace. Exactly. In addition, just one other... The, the, the question is, who's winning? I mean, who gets something out of this? That question was raised. Well, who does get something out of this? The Palestinian leadership that's ripped off the Palestinian people for billions of dollars, which is documented in the UN. The wealthy Arab countries that want to destroy Israel and don't want a Palestinian state because the last thing they want is a Palestinian state that's democratic and have... It supported and fomented violence throughout this entire situation and pressed for no, no peace. I'll stop there. Okay. Well, let's go through it. The Arabushim quote is not mine. I was quoting a leading Israeli military authority from 20 years ago describing what is happening to the Israelis as they are crushing the Arabushim, in his words, and refusing to let them raise their heads and treating them like drugged roaches scurrying in a bottle. You don't need to repeat it. We may all heard may what I you continue? Said. Did I interrupt you? Okay. That's who I quoted. The anti Jewish rhetoric in the Palestinian and Arab press is exactly true, and therefore, if the U.S. 
were spending billions of dollars to support that, I'd oppose it. But since the U.S. is not supporting it at all, uh, give I still lots of, See, Egypt's like the country we give the second most yeah, amount of aid to. Right, because If Israel, you add the aid to Egypt, me, Egypt, Egypt, yeah, Egypt Jordan... Yeah, Egypt is right after Israel, and the reason is because of its alliance... And the reason is because of its alliance with Israel. That aid to Egypt is conditional on Egypt supporting uh, Israel and the United States. The minute they stop supporting it, aid goes to zero. So Israel is strongly in favor of that aid, contrary to you, uh, and I'm against it. I don't think that we ought to be giving military aid to either of them. Uh, but uh, Israel insists on both. Uh, third, uh, on the Saudi plan, yeah, uh, you're just wrong. I mean, check. Uh, Saudi Arabia offered full negotiations, full agreement. Uh, Israel rejected it. The, uh, on, uh, um, That's not what the Saudi ambassador to the UN said. Well, you, I'm telling you what they offered. On the fact that the Palestinian leaders ripped off and so on and took billions of dollars, that's absolutely true. I've been condemning it for 10 years. That was part of the U.S.-Israeli program. When they instituted this idea of a permanent neo-colonial dependency, uh, the model was, in fact, South Africa. And yes, they wanted a Palestinian leadership. In fact, if you, want me to, if you would go back to 1993, there was an authentic Palestinian leadership which was negotiating in Washington. It refused to accept uh, an arrangement which permitted further Israeli settlements illegal in the occupied territories. Therefore, the U.S. and Israel undercut them. They brought in a bunch of thugs, you're absolutely right, uh, Arafat and his cronies, who were very weak at the time because they were being, uh, there were efforts even in the, in the refugee camps and in, Pal in, uh, in Palestine to try to get rid of them. Uh, Israel and the United States brought them in, made a deal with them. The deal was that they would control the Palestinian population by violence and torture if necessary. In return, they could rip off any amount of money they wanted I mean, Arafat had his huge bank accounts in Bank Lumi and Tel Aviv. And Israel and the United States completely accepted that as long as they were doing their job. Just and their model, South Africa, did the same. Now, they didn't care if the black leadership in Transkei ripped off the population. That's fine, as long as they control them. That's the deal. Uh, Israel and the United States turned against it when Arafat couldn't control them any longer. Then all of a sudden he became useless and you find somebody else. Uh, the model is very similar to South Africa. As for the offer, uh, they're not splitting the country. The country was, uh, you, you want to look at the history, I mean, the country was what's now the country, internationally recognized, uh, includes uh, a Palestinian state that was split virtually in half between Transjordan, what's now Jordan, and Israel by agreement. Uh, it was uh, this kind of collusion in which they basically agreed to partition the Palestinian state as they did. Uh, the half that was in, taken over by Jordan is what's called the West Bank. Uh, the half that was taken over by Israel nobody even talks about at all. That's, everyone assumes that to be part of Israel. Uh, so the international border, the Green Line, recognized internationally by everyone, officially by the U.S. even, uh, splits the Cisjordan, the, uh, the mandatory Palestine, west of the Jordan. It splits it into 78%, which everybody recognizes to be Israel, no question, nobody's talking about it, and 22%, uh, which uh, the international, in fact, everybody in the world practically outside the United States and Israel, uh, has called to designate a Palestinian state in, uh, 19, in the mid-70s. That's the split. Now, what you're saying is that Israel's going to, and some extremist Israelis say the same thing, that Israel would lose if it gave up some of the 20% that it has been illegally settling and integrating into its own territory, so it has to be less than that. Well, you know, if you think that, okay, but I don't think you're going to find many takers in the world. Uh, the internationally recognized border uh, by the U.S. as well is the pre-67 border, which grants Israel 78% of the territory, including the half of the designated Palestinian state that they took when they partitioned it with Jordan. At issue uh, is the other half, the part that Jordan took. Uh, what happens to that? Well, uh, the, uh, it, you're absolutely right about negotiations, uh, but Israel insisted on not having them. It would only accept 
a settlement in the 22 percent of the kind that I've now described half a dozen times, and you can check it if you like, uh, which separated the 22 percent into four separated cantons. Small area of East Jerusalem, which is the center of Palestinian life, separated from the other three, and the other three are divided by towns and big infrastructure developments and so on, modeled on South Africa 40 years ago. I mean, you know, there were white South Africans 40 years ago who said, look, we're giving up too much when we established Transkei and Siskei and so on. I mean, we're giving part of our territory to black states. Why should we do that? We want the whole thing. You know, look how much we're giving up. Uh, we're allowing them to have a black state run by black gangsters, very much like the Palestinian Authority, who rip off the population, control it by force. Uh, and meanwhile, we uh, build... Um, development zones around the edge, so we consider ourselves very humane because they can work at subhuman levels and what amounts to maculadoras. Uh, and uh, that's the South African line. Well, fortunately, nobody accepted it. Why should we accept it when it's the Israeli line? I don't see any reason to. So yes, that was, I can go on and talk about that. You're right about the ripping off and so on. You're wrong about this. I mean, you're right about the splitting in a way. I mean, yes. I'm not arguing that. I'm saying that fine, uh, you right missed my point to, entirely. The right way to deal totally with it is point. negotiations. And in fact, those negotiations went on right through the increased atrocities in the territories, which incidentally, I didn't go into this, but they were U.S. atrocities. I mean, right after the Intifada started, Israel began, if you want me to go into it, I will. Israel began using U.S. helicopters, they don't make helicopters, to attack uh, apartment complexes and other civilian targets. In the first couple of days, they killed uh, several unwounded, several dozen people. Uh, that was actually reported. Uh, on October 3rd, after three days of this, uh, Clinton made the biggest deal in a decade to send more military helicopters to Israel, knowing what they were being used for, namely murdering civilians in the occupied territories. Extensive detailed reports on this by the Israeli and international human rights organizations, if you want to look. Uh, the U.S. press, including our local newspaper, refused to report it, literally. Refused to report that the United States is sending, making the biggest deal in a decade to send more military helicopters to Israel when that's what they're doing with them in addition to what I described by the IDF. Uh, meanwhile, negotiations continued. They continued up until Taba, uh, where, I, if you want to check, there is an independent record accepted by both sides. I gave the rough outlines, and I can detail more if you like. Israel pulled out, so we don't know what was going to happen. And since then, there have been no negotiations, although the Palestinian Authority, who I agree are a bunch of thugs and gangsters, uh, have been calling for negotiations, and Israel has been refusing. And in, by now, it's true that the balance of terror has shifted. Instead of being virtually 100 percent Palestinians in the territories, and then in the early days of the Intifada, down to maybe five or six to one uh, Palestinians, it's now down to about three or four to one. You, you, you entirely missed my point. And Pardon? You entirely missed my point. What was your point? My point is that the solution to the problem is an end of violence. Right. And of terrorism, you, that's right. if the suicide murders and if shooting, trying to shoot planes out of the sky with, with missiles stopped, then the, we Israeli, go back. the Israeli popular polls have already shown that people are ready for dismantling settlements, which they already offered, etc. I mean, you might not like the solution. Maybe you consider it cantons, maybe somebody else considers it something else. I don't think that's the point. The point is that you can solve those problems at the negotiation table, Absolutely. or you can solve those problems by trying to blow up somebody because you, you don't like it, or you don't feel you can get your way, right. or you're, you have whatever yeah, I excuse I don't you like have. the fact that Israel, with U.S. backing, has killed tens of thousands of Palestinians and Lebanese over the years in unprovoked attacks. Uh, if you want the detail, I gave you some, I'll give you more. I don't like that at all. I don't like the fact that they were crushing the Arabushim in the territories exactly as they describe. And I don't like the fact that the Palestinians are finally reacting with violence too. Uh, and yes, we could settle it by negotiations, but what's going to be negotiated? I mean, South Africa offered negotiations to its black population 40 years ago. Yeah, in fact, they not only offered negotiations, they gave them independent states. 
They didn't offer it. They gave them to them. So why didn't the ANC and Nelson Mandela just go home and quit? Why didn't they just accept these forthcoming negotiations by South Africa? Well, we know the answer to that. And the answer is the same here. Does it justify violence, either the minor violence by Palestinians or the huge violence by Israel and the United States? No, it doesn't justify any of it. None of the violence is justified. Nobody is justified in saying, because you killed my cousin, I'm going to kill your cousin. No, nobody's justified in doing that. But let's be honest enough to recognize that you and I are responsible for the overwhelming mass of violence, almost all of it in the past, and most of it now. When we recognize that, we can go on. I want to thank you all for, for your endurance. Thanks, Professor Chomsky, for his endurance. And uh, I want to thank everyone for contributing over $400 to help in the Defense Fund, which is really, really important and uh, a great tribute to you all. Thanks so much.